Boris. Is the world a safer place? Swarbrick on Sunday starts after the news at 10. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 10 o'clock. Joe Biden has promised to win the confidence of the whole of America after becoming president-elect of the United States. Speaking in his hometown of Wilmington in Delaware, Mr Biden said his election win was a victory for the people. Let us be the nation that we know we can be. A nation united, a nation strengthened, a nation healed. The United States of America, ladies and gentlemen, there's never, never been anything we've tried we've not been able to do. His vice president, Kamala Harris, will be the first black woman to hold the role. The California senator, who's also the first person of South Asian descent elected to the position, will become the highest ranking woman ever to serve in the US government. There have been celebrations all over the US and these people in Wilmington say it's a hugely significant win. This is the best day America could have hoped for. It's good to see everyone's out here peacefully and it's time for America to get back to being who we are. I'm just happy that the exhaustion will be over, the stress of what every day was going to bring with him. But there were also protests by Donald Trump supporters. The incumbent hasn't yet conceded the defeat and has made more unsubstantiated claims of voter fraud. Greg Swenson from Republicans Overseas says he's not sure there's much point. It looks to me like even if he wins some court cases somehow or even if some votes are tossed out or other votes are tossed in, I I just don't see a clear path to really overcoming the deficit. And many leaders across the world appear to have accepted the result. Here in the UK, Boris Johnson, Nicola Sturgeon, Mark Drakeford and Arlene Foster have all offered Joe Biden and Kamala Harris their congratulations. The Prime Minister says he's looking forward to working together closely. Defence Secretary Ben Wallace has told Swarbrick on Sunday he hopes the special relationship can continue. Day in, day out, the United States and the United Kingdom work together militarily around the world to defend our values, to keep us safe here at home, keep the United States safe at home. And that speaks volumes for what our real relationship is. You can hear that full interview coming up with Tom Swarbrick. Scaled back Remembrance Sunday services will be taking place across the UK this morning. A two minute silence will be held in an hour's time at 11 o'clock to commemorate those who've lost their lives in conflict. And the Queen will attend a socially distanced ceremony at the Cenotaph. Stephen Mullis will be representing the RAF Association. Just looking around, Whitehall is empty. I think it's also more poignant, the fact that it is empty. It's a little bit like representing those that didn't come back with the empty spaces and everything else like that. The weather, a cloudy and dull day across most of the UK, with fog persisting for parts of east and northeast England. Some rain in the west, heavy in places, gradually moving northeastwards. The best of the brightness will be in northern Scotland, a high of 14 Celsius. From Global's newsroom, I'm Holly Harris. is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick, live from Westminster. Just gone 10. Hello, good morning. Welcome to the show you are listening to and watching Swarbrick on Sunday live here on LBC. I'm Tom Swarbrick. Hope we find you very well this Sunday morning. Coming up, she once called him an asteroid of awfulness. Labour's Shadow International Trade Secretary Emily Thornbury did not hold back on her feelings towards President Trump. We'll speak to her about it. As the nation pauses to remember those who gave the ultimate sacrifice for this country this Remembrance Sunday, I'll be joined by Captain Sir Tom Moore and the Defence Secretary Ben Wallace on the future of our, our armed forces. Call 0345 60 60 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. 
very good morning to you. After days and days of seemingly interminable number crunching, it was CNN who finally tapped the nail into Donald Trump's political coffin. At four o'clock UK time yesterday afternoon, the network said it was confident that Joe Biden had enough of the votes in the right places to see him win the swing state of Pennsylvania and put him over the 270 electoral college votes required to win the White House. Donald Trump hearing the news on his golf course, sought to spin defeat as victory, tweeting 71 million legal votes, the most ever for a sitting president. It's perhaps a mark of how seriously that governments around the world are taking his claims of electoral fraud, that the leaders of the most powerful nations around the world have offered their congratulations to Mr. Biden. In the early hours of this morning, the president-elect spoke to the nation. The people of this nation have spoken. They've delivered us a clear victory, a convincing victory, a victory for we the people. I'm proud of the coalition we put together, the broadest and most diverse coalition in history. Democrats, Republicans, independents, progressives, moderates, conservatives, young, old, urban, suburban, rural, gay, straight, transgender, white, Latino, Asian, Native American. I mean it, especially those moments, and especially those moments when this campaign was at its lowest ebb, the African-American community stood up again for me. You've always had my back, and I'll have yours. For all those of you who voted for President Trump, I understand the disappointment tonight. I've lost a couple times myself, but now, Let's give each other a chance. We must restore the soul of America. Our nation is shaped by the constant battle between our better angels and our darkest impulses. And what presidents say in this battle matters. It's time for our better angels to prevail. Tonight, the whole world is watching America. President-elect Joe Biden speaking in Delaware in the early hours of this morning UK time. Those were the celebrations. Now the work begins on the morning after the night before we come on to how Boris Johnson faces an uphill battle, it would seem, to have a strong working relationship with President-elect Biden. We'll speak to the Defence Secretary Ben Wallace. I'm joined live this morning by Emily Thornbury, uh, Shadow International Trade Secretary, Labour MP for Islington South and Finsbury. Great to have you on the programme this morning, Emily. Thank you for coming on. You once referred to him as an asteroid of awfulness. Um, he He's burnt up, hasn't he now, Donald Trump? Not completely, I don't think. I mean, he's right. You know, over 70 million people voted for him. He will continue to be their voice in many ways. Um, and I suspect he will be on the sidelines tweeting and agitating. So the challenge for Joe, Joe Bryden <coughs> is, to, is, to, is to deliver on his promise to be a president for the whole of America and not just blue America. So... Um, that's what he needs to do, and he needs to make sure that he is delivering to those who, you know, f have been attracted to Donald Trump for a number of reasons, not least, I think, because they felt that they were marginalised, that they weren't being taken seriously or even being thought of at all. And so I think it's really important that Joe Biden and his team make it clear that when they're making decisions, when they close their eyes, who it is they're thinking about, they're thinking about, you know, people in who, who you know, in the Rust Belt, as they call it, or people in rural areas who feel like like their voice is never heard. Mm. We'll come on to the political parallels with the UK in just a moment. Do you think the world, though, is, is a safer place with Donald Trump out of the White House and Joe Biden in it? I think that can't be overstated how much safer we are now. I think the the truth is is that Donald Trump was always a disruptor. He always just wanted to smash things up and see what would happen next. And you just can't do that with the world order. There's a reason why the world has been organized in the way that it is. It's really important that we don't just have a president who says America first. You know, America can't do well in a world that is you know, that is dying around it. So we need to make sure that we all work together. We have to. 
be tackling the biggest challenge, which is climate change. You know, I mean, yesterday mm -hmm. or two days ago, you know, America left the Paris climate change agreement because Donald Trump stamped his feet and insisted on so. The way in which he did foreign relations was, you know, to have standoffs with people, to, to, to walk us to the absolute brink of war and then walk away again. Um, I mean, look what happened in North Korea. A lot of people Korea. praised Trump for that, though. A lot of people praised yeah, Trump people for being a president that didn't take yeah. us to war. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, people praised him, but I think that what they should do is think about in the long term, does it do any good or not? So are there less nuclear weapons in North Korea now? Is our relationship with Iran more stable now? It, you know, are the so-called doves in a, the ascendancy in Iran? No, they're not. The hawks are in the ascendancy now because the Iranian nuclear deal has been torn up and it's given extra sucker to the hawks who always were against the Iranian nuclear deal. But because the Americans walked away from it, it has meant that the, um, the Iranian nuclear deal that took decades to negotiate, yeah. you know, is in tatters at the moment. So all of these things make our, make our world less, you know, less safe. If we don't do something about a two-state solution in the Middle East that will continue to be a you know a cause of, of well, resentment deep resentment yeah. around the world Let, all these the reasons you know. uh, yeah absolutely and, and we'll, we'll pick over some of that a bit later on with the with the defense secretary uh, Ben Wallace um, yes. coming back to the political parallels here about how Joe Biden built a coalition of voters to secure the White House um, do, do you understand as someone that is, has been very outspoken and critical of President Trump do you understand why 71 million people voted for him? Do you understand how people could come to the conclusion that he'd be the right man, even though you, you clearly sort of despite him? Yeah, I mean, for the reasons that I was talking about earlier, you know, which is about people not feeling that they were being listened to, they feeling as though policy was never about them, decisions were never made and their interests were only made in the interests of, of particular people, that we didn't mm. have a president who looked after the whole of the country. So I think that Do there think was that... that could that, be a charge that was lab could be labelled of, of the... Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn, that it spoke to too select an audience. And now the opportunity is there for Keir Starmer in, in your new shadow cabinet to widen that message to more people, perhaps even those who are culturally to the right of where the Labour Party is. The best prime ministers, the best presidents you know, are a, a, a prime ministers and presidents who, who, who rule on behalf of the whole country and not just part of it. Of course, we will have ideological differences. You know, the Labour Party is on the left. And, um, and so it will be that more progressive people and left people are likely to vote for it. But actually, I think many people these days will think in Britain, since you asked me, um, many people who would see themselves as centrist would think that actually we have slipped, the, the dial has, has slipped far too far to the right and that we need to, to reset things and that the best thing to do at the next election will be to vote Labour and to reset the dial and for us to, to be able to go forward in a more sensible way. And I where, suspect where on the they right will look has it slipped? The, where on the right is this? Lit? Which particular issues okay. do you think most people, so, most voters look at it, most centrists look at it and think it's too right. far so to the I right think, now? So I think that they think, why is why is this government having to be dragged kicking and screaming into looking after children who aren't getting enough to eat during school holidays? Why is it that child poverty is going up in the way that it is? You know, I think that those are, t those are things, you know, the, the, the increasing inequality, I think, is something that people will see, you know, this is not right and actually mm -hmm. a more progressive government will have had that in their sight as being a primary thing. I think um, not putting enough emphasis on the National Health Service and on social care. You know, I think that everybody wants us to have a real world class service in, in that respect. And it isn't mm -hmm. enough just to say that it is, but to actually put the money in and to put the focus into ensuring that we have a social care service that is that is worthy of the name because they and look the after the, the most vulnerable. Do you think the Labour Party is overtly patriotic enough to appeal to those people who are perhaps more culturally on the right? Of course we're patriotic. Of course we love our country. And what we want for our country is the best. And we don't want to have a... We want to have a... We're patriotic about our country and we are confident in our country. We believe that we could do more and we could do better. That's why we're patriotic. That's why we believe in it. That's the evidence. You know, Britain could be so much more than it is at the moment, if only if it was led in the right way. But I think um, that, you know, that we are going through a phase of, 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 of actually a lack of confidence and a, you know, and big talk, but very little being delivered. Okay. 
Emily Thorne, be really good to speak to you. Thank you very much for coming on the programme. Shadow International Trade Secretary and Labour MP for Islington South and Finsbury. Very good to have you on the programme this morning. Uh, we'll come on to reaction from the States in just a moment about the uh, election of President-elect Joe Biden. But not everybody is happy with it, of course, and people are still fighting it. Take a listen to this. This is Rudy Giuliani, the president's uh, personal lawyer, the former mayor of New York, speaking at a press conference in Philadelphia yesterday. Take a listen. Oh, my goodness. All the networks. Wow. All the networks. We have to forget about the law. Judges don't count. All the networks, all the networks, all the networks thought Biden was going to win by 10 percent. Gee, what happened? Come on. Don't be don't be ridiculous. Networks don't get to decide elections. Courts do. I think it's fair to say he's taking it well. We'll speak to Pippa Milgram, Special Assistant to President George W. Bush in a few moments. Want your thoughts too. Is the world now a safer place with President-elect Biden in charge? 0345 6060 You're watching Tom Swarbrick here. Swarbrick on Sunday on LBC, 10.15. This is LBC. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick, live from Westminster on LBC. Morning to you. 10.18 is the time this, the morning after the night before. President-elect Joe Biden giving that speech in Delaware, promising to heal the United States. Donald Trump, well, he's going nowhere. And his claims about winning the election uh, are still being made by him and his surrogates. I see that there is a suggestion that some of his family around him in the White House are now perhaps having to tell him that the jig is up. But... He says that the processes need to be followed, that they need to, the courts, hear the allegations that they are making about electoral fraud, not that they have made it.
any quite yet. Uh, we'll speak to Ben Wallace, the Secretary of State for Defence, in just a few moments. I want to get from you about whether or not you think the world is a safer place with Joe Biden at the helm of the White House. We'll speak to Marcus in Basingstoke in, Stoke in just a sec. Let's turn first to Pippa Malgram, former Special Assistant to President George W. Bush, author of the new book, The Infinite Leader. Thank you very much for joining the programme this morning, Pippa. Um, first of all, your view on what Joe Biden said uh, to the American people and to the world yesterday. Well, he talked about representing not just the Democrats who won, but the whole country. And that's really what needed to be said, that this needs to be a unifying president. And also, look, he's been in politics a long time, so he fully understands that Trump won three million more voters than he had the first time around. And so his constituency is big and powerful and cannot be ignored or shunted to the side. And it does have implications for how he'll govern. I think it means that he can't move policy as far to the left, for example, as some might have expected. You know, the Bernie Sanders end of the spectrum isn't going to have mm. as much voice because of what Trump did accomplish with his constituents. Um, but I think that the main thing now is looking forward. And you've got to remember that even though Trump is potentially leaving the White House, although we don't know how yet, uh, Saturday Night Live is already doing sketches of him having an OJ style police chase to get him out of the White House. Uh, but what we do know is that he won't go away. And I think that there's a very high chance that he will launch a media platform. He will seek to continue control the narrative by mm -hmm. using that platform and generating a lot of cash, which he's going to need because he faces at least 12 separate state and federal investigations into his businesses. What do you think becomes of the Republican Party now? I see people like Marco Rubio, the senator who previously ran against Donald Trump to be president. I mean, they're just sort of, uh, you know, embarrassing themselves, it strikes me, by, mm -hmm. by continuing to back the president, even though he has clearly lost. I mean, as, as someone that advised a Republican president, are you not slightly embarrassed by elements of the Republican Party? Uh, yeah, look, the Republicans have been embarrassed for a while uh, and yet totally intrigued that Trump energized the Republican base in a way that no other Republican had for years. Um, and frankly, if Trump had not been just so downright rude and obnoxious, mm. actually, he might have turned out to be quite an exceptionally highly ranked president, right? It was only his personal qualities that diminished it. And so a lot of Republicans are afraid to challenge what he stands for. How do you think he was able, just finally, how do you think he was able to turn out such huge numbers? As you say, 70 million people voted for him. That's enormous constituency of folks in the US. Totally. What it really tells you is America is much more conservative than international observers believe. That's conservative with a small C. Yeah. So even though the public didn't vote for conservative with a capital C, they're pretty conservative, pro-business, not really as far left as money expected the country to be. Pippa, great to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Pippa Malgram, former special assistant to President George W. Bush, author of the new book, Infinite Leader. I do think there are parallels, by the way, with politics in the UK and the Labour Party. If we're now saying that the centre-left can win elections, Joe Biden being the example of it, what does that mean for how the Labour Party speaks to those of you who are perhaps more culturally on the right, much more uh, overtly patriotic, much more sort of traditional, small t traditional? What does Sir Keir Starmer and the Labour Party do to appeal to you? We'll speak to uh, the Defence Secretary in just a moment. Marcus is in Basingstoke, meanwhile. Hi, Marcus. Hi, Tom. How are you? I'm first time caller to your show, actually. Well, welcome to the programme, sir. Your thoughts on what we've witnessed over the last few days? Um, I just want to say, I mean, for me, okay, for me, I'm a neutral uh, for the kind of kind of uh, observer, right? And um, what I see right now, I mean, I was just telling your, uh, your your producer earlier, you cannot have a United States of America that has 71 million people that voted for your opponent if they're still disenfranchised, they don't know if the election was free or fair. Now, for me, as I was telling your uh, your producer earlier. This, if, if, this, if this goes to the court, right, and the court then decides, then we'll know what happens. I mean, if you look at what happened with Bush and Gore, I mean, I actually even checked on YouTube the other day for Bush and Gore, and I saw all the comments. They were like, yeah, you know, um, 
you know, the comments on there were oh, 2020 is just the same as 2000. The well, it was true to there. say that the, the election was called by some of the TV networks in the States for Gore, and then we all knew we know what happened subsequently with the court cases and the, and the fact and that... And how many days was that there. later? But Marcus, there is no days? suggestion. The president has not brought any evidence at all of widespread voter for, fraud that could overturn that. the no, result. No, I understand that. You see, I understand that he has not brought that forth. But remember... We are not doing a thing where you just think, you know, courts don't necessarily look at things as how the media does. You understand? So, for example, when CNN said, OK, we are projected that Donald Trump will be a winner, almost everybody within a few seconds. By the way, uh, what, what day is it today? It's Sunday the 8th, right? The election happened on the 3rd. So you're telling me that they're still counting votes now and you are going to then have to say, well, no, 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 everything was all fair and above board. The Electoral College doesn't decide ultimately until the middle of December. So there's plenty of, uh, Marcus, thank you, there's plenty of way to go on actually coming to a decision. But to to a point, I would agree with you that it feels very odd that the thing that apparently decides an election seems to be the media's projection of who's going to win. That does feel rather odd. And it says something too about the claims that Trump is making that Boris Johnson Johnson and uh, Modi in India and every other world leader you wish to name has already come out and congratulated Joe Biden on being the president-elect. Marcus, thank you. We'll speak to Lionel Barber in a few moments' time, former editor of the Financial Times, uh, author as well, his private diaries are coming out about uh, his interviews with both Obama and Trump. We'll speak to him. But a little earlier this morning, I spoke to Ben Wallace, Secretary of State for Defence, Conservative MP for Weir and Preston North. And I started by asking him what he has made of Joe Biden winning the presidency. Well, I, I, I think, first of all, the British government wants to congratulate President-elect uh, Joe Biden and his uh, deputy Kamala Harris, uh, uh, you know, the new vice president-elect. You know, that's a historic occasion for the United States. She will be the first woman and indeed the first from her ethnic background to be uh, the vice president-elect. And I think we should congratulate them on that. I mean, look, I've worked with American lawmakers, as they call them in America, for, for, for decades. In fact, my parents lived in Pennsylvania, not far from Delaware. So I understand uh, American politics. I understand America. Our relationship is very, very broad and very, very deep. It, mm. The special relationship is just about the incumbent and the, office, the Oval Office on which week and which year. It's about all of the interests and the investments we have of and the common values. And, of course it so is, but, share, but you know too, Mr. Wallace, you know too that the relationship at the top does matter. And right now there are plenty of um, uh, suggestions that the relation at the top is going to be pretty frosty between Joe Biden and Boris Johnson, not least because of a, a lingering uh, loathing, actually, of something that Mr. Johnson said previously when, when the bust of Winston Churchill was removed from the Oval Office by President Obama. Mr. Johnson wrote, quote, that it was a symbol of the part Kenyan president's ancestral dislike of the British Empire. You have former Obama people, potentially people going into the Biden White House calling Mr Johnson a shape-shifting creep, saying we will never forget your racist comments about Obama and slavish devotion to Trump. That's not getting off on the best footing, is it? No. First of all, uh, I didn't say it didn't matter. It always matters who's in the White House because uh, obviously the President of the United States is the leader of the free world. Uh, and what I also know from experience is that you know, the, the leader of the White House the president-elect and the current president now, they will act in the interest of the United States. They, they, won't, they won't be influenced by uh, briefings by aides and nameless people or even people that I've never really heard of. They will be influenced because their duty is to the American people and to the state of America. And in that, the American presidents know that one of the countries around the world that share their values of democracy, of open society, of free trade, mm-hmm. uh, is the United Kingdom. That's what will unite us, not, uh, you know, side briefings from AIDS. What will unite us is getting down to business. And the United Kingdom looks forward to getting down to business with President-elect Joe Biden. We've had a good relationship with President Trump and will continue to do so until that power transitions. But it has always been the case that the United Kingdom is actually united with the United States on values, on security. Okay. And we're going to look forward to working with them at both COP26 and indeed the G7 next year. And just in a word, is the world now safer that President Trump is no longer going to be president? Look, it's, <laughs> the world is unsafe, not because of who is the president of the United States. The world is unsafe because of the actions of countries like Russia, the proliferation of technologies to terrorist groups, uh, because of the use of the internet by countries like China to steal intellectual property. That is why the world is unsafe. Uh, and he was I going to pull out of that. That's where the United States... 
Just all speculation. I, I did quite a lot of work with Mark Esper, my colleague in the Pentagon, the US Defense Secretary. He still is a US Defense Secretary. Uh, and there was no mention of pulling out of NATO. That was just froth and speculation. The simple reality is, day in, day out, the United States, the United Kingdom work together militarily around the world to defend our values, to keep us safe here at home, keep the United States safe at home. And that speaks volumes for what our real relationship is. And no matter who, whether it's a democratic government in America or Republican, what matters is that we share those values and we share our common security and investments as well. Defence Secretary Ben Wallace speaking to me a little bit earlier this morning on Swarbrick on Sunday. Froth and speculation, the idea that Donald Trump would be pulling us out of NATO. Let's turn to Lionel Barber, former editor of the Financial Times, the author of The Powerful and the Damned, and also presenter of an LBC podcast, What Next, which I highly recommend. Lionel, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, just first of all, picking up on what Ben Wallace said there, that the threat to the world is not decided upon by who is in the White House, and that the question about NATO was froth and speculation. Well, I don't believe that President Trump would be looking at drawing, if he had got a second term, at withdrawing uh, the US from the NATO alliance. But I think that his hostility to alliances in general and his transactional approach to everything, his aggression uh, in trying to shake down everybody, everything was a deal, uh, everything came down to money as opposed to values, that that was detrimental to the alliances and indeed to the relationship between the US and the UK and the US and Europe. Mm. In your uh, dealings with President Trump, when, when you went over there to, to interview him, um, how did he come across to you when the to sort of the tape was turned off, when the cameras were down or however you're not you were recording it? Did, did he change at all between being up on stage and being off stage, as it were? Not too much. Um, I mean, he was performing both in private and in public. Um, but I do remember him taking me uh, round a tour of the uh, of the Oval Office and then one of the side rooms uh, as if it was uh, almost a hotel and how his predecessor, uh, Barack Obama, had really not looked after the place. And he pointed to a portrait and he said, you know who that is? And I said, yes, I do, sir. Uh, that is Teddy Roosevelt. And I paused and said, and by the way, uh, he spoke softly but carried a big stick, which was a, a gentle sort of tweak. <laughs> did he respond uh, he to the laugh. tweak? Did he did he nod at you, Lionel, and say, great advice, I'll take that? <laughs> I don't think he did. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 don't think, uh, he, I don't think he got the joke, frankly, because everything is so much centred and was centred around the president. Now, that's true in general, but I've never seen anything, and I've interviewed five American presidents, I've never seen anything like Donald Trump in the Oval Office. It was like a king in a medieval court, which, by the way, may explain why he's having so much reluctance in accepting the election result and leaving. Lionel Barber, great to talk to you. Thank you. Former editor of the Financial Times, author of The Powerful and the Damned, and you can download his podcast, LBC's What Next podcast, which, um, among other interviews, interviews uh, Lionel interviews Tony Blair, which I would highly recommend. I have to say that having heard a bit of President Trump in private on, on various phone calls and in meetings and things like that, there's no difference between the Trump persona on stage and the Trump persona off stage. He is exactly the same man that you see on stage and in front of the cameras and doing those rallies as you would hear or see uh, in, in meetings or bilateral. Um, there was no change whatsoever. I guess the tone of how those meetings are conducted and the tone of, of the president's um, uh, presentation of himself is going to be markedly different under Joe Biden. 0345 6060 is my number. We'll come to your calls in just a moment. Let's get some news headlines first this Sunday morning with Holly Harris. Emily Thornbury has told LBC she thinks the world will be a safer place when Donald Trump has left the White House. The Shadow International Trade Secretary says the president-elect Joe Biden can now hope to rebuild America's relationships with foreign powers. Donald Trump is yet to acknowledge Joe Biden's victory. His lawyers are preparing lawsuits over allegations of voter fraud, but they're yet to release any evidence. A two-minute silence will be held in half an hour's time at 11 o'clock this morning to mark Remembrance Sunday. A scaled-back ceremony will be held at the Cenotaph, attended by the Prime Minister and members of the Royal Family. 
the weather, cloudy across the UK with some rain in the west, which will be heavy in places. The best of the brightness in northern Scotland, a high of 14 Celsius. This is LBC. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Text 84850. Morning to you. It's been a frenetic few days, hasn't it, as this uh, election took place and then the result was in doubt and then it took days and days and days to finally get one. We haven't finally got one, as in not all the votes have been counted yet, but as you've been hearing and seeing, President-elect Biden has made the speech after the US networks called it for him. Amid all the froth and the fury and the frenetic activity that's taken place, we will, as we do every year on Remembrance Sunday, pause at 11 o'clock for two minutes to remember those who gave their lives in service of this country. We will then speak to Captain Sir Tom Moore, who'll join us after that two minute silence after the news at 11. We'll speak to the former acting US ambassador to the UK in just a moment. First, here's Steve in Dartford on whether we are now safer as a world based on the election of Joe Biden. Hi there, Steve. Hello there, Tom. Well, it depends, of course, on what he does. Uh, he may make the world safer. He may make it safer in the short run, but make it less safe <clears throat> in the long run. For example, if he appeases Iran by a renewal of the JCPOA, as Emily Thornberry was calling for, he may produce some degree of calm for a while, but all he's doing is kicking the can down the road. 
Many commentators consider that agreement to provide Iran with lots of benefits in the form of cash released from sanctions Mm -hmm. and an opportunity to develop nuclear arms over a longer, slower period. There's plenty of people who take that view, in particular the leaders of Israel and Saudi Arabia. And I'm Mm -hmm. very worried that there's a tendency on the part of members of the Democrat Party, in particular key congresswomen in the form of the so-called squad, who take the view that the Abraham Accords, a remarkable achievement by President Trump, for which he gets absolutely no this is the uh, uh, this is the for those for those who uh, haven't been following this this is the agreement between israel the uae and bahrain right to normalize relations that is correct and undoubtedly if president trump had been re-elected there would have been a clear pathway to involving both sudan and more significantly saudi arabia in that arrangement. but no path to involve uh, to involve the palestinian authorities no because i mean they're completely you... shut out of those negotiations absolutely and and quite rightly because they've had every opportunity over many decades so steve your view agreement. is that actually going back to what happened before re-engaging with the iran deal as, as joe biden has suggested or even perhaps even the paris climate accord as he said he would do that's not the answer from your point of view because actually the questions donald trump was asking of these deals were the right questions would that be fair uh, i can't comment on the paris climate uh, accord I'm, I'm more neutral on that issue just as i'm completely uh, neutral on the trans-pacific partnership the trade agreement mm-hmm. that trump also pulled out of but his pathway on peace between arabs and israelis was at the very least highly arguable and i'm very concerned that out of pride President Biden will trash that, will trash it. After all, John Kerry is on the record um, in videos saying that there is no chance, he said it in 2015, I think, no chance of peace between any Arab state and Israel other than by giving lots of lovely concessions to the Palestinians. Trump proved them uh, wrong, 100% wrong, and I am concerned that Biden will think, oh, I can't be seen to be doing something that Barack Obama would disapprove of. And as a result, trashes those agreements and we're back to a more dangerous world. We'll wait and see. Steve, thank you very much indeed for your call. 0345 6060973. Before we come to Lewis Lukens, let me run you through the front pages of this morning's Sunday papers. The Sunday Telegraph to begin with. Big picture of Joe Biden. It's time for America to heal, they say. Uh, Biden's supporters celebrate after epic vote count, but Trump warns this election is far from over. Get yourself down to lbc.co.uk. lbc.co.uk. Joe Biden, quote... The people of the nation have spoken. They have delivered us a clear victory. The Sunday Times, Sleepy Joe Wakes Up America, uh, with a picture of celebrating voters in the United States. They have an interesting line, too, on the future of the US-UK relationship. Uh, More about that with the uh, Secretary of State for Defence, Ben Wallace, a bit later on. The Mail on Sunday. PM's astonishing bid to nail Leaker, who bounced him into lockdown. Ministers' mobiles searched in chatty rat hunt. Uh, This is the leak in the papers on last Saturday, wasn't it, that caused that press conference to come forward onto Halloween, which meant we are all in lockdown right now. Daily Star uh, told (laughs) you, typical Star headline this, old fart wins election. The senile one beats the lunatic, which... (laughs) One way of describing it. Uh, Sunday Express, unite and heal, but Trump fumes this isn't over as he spends the day on the golf course. Sunday Mirror, time to heal Biden's message of unity as he becomes the 46th president of the United States. Sunday People, God bless America, loser Trump given boot. Biden is prez. And in the Observer, big picture, Joe Biden, I will be president for all Americans. They say it's Joe with a picture of a smiling president-elect. Let's turn to Lewis Lukens, former acting US ambassador to the UK, former deputy chief of mission at US Embassy in London, now a senior partner with Signum Global Advisors. Thank you for being there this morning, Mr Lukens. What do you think the US-UK relationship goes from here now with President Biden and Prime Minister Johnson? Well, I think the relationship, this is a real opportunity to reset the relationship and realign on some of the values that, that bound us together as countries until President Trump came into office. Um, you know, if you put aside the, this this notion that there's this great friendly relationship between Boris Johnson and Donald Trump, which I think is a little bit overblown, on, on the policy issues that we have traditionally worked on around the world, whether it's confronting climate change or terrorism or dealing with Iran and China and Russia, um, we've had big differences in policies and approaches over the last 
four years that we didn't have under previous presidents. And I think we'll be realigned on the policy front um, as soon as Joe Biden comes into office. Well, doesn't that reflect some of what we were hearing from from Steve, my last caller, in, in concern about basically going back to the way it was before? And there are 70 million Americans who feel that Donald Trump was the was doing the right thing on those issues. And actually, there will be some within governments around the world that think the question that he was raising about NATO, the questions he was raising about the Iran deal were the right questions to ask. Well, first of all, I would speculate that most of Donald Trump's supporters were not focused on international relations and foreign policy. I think they were more worried about pocketbook issues back at home. Um, I, I disagreed with your last caller. I mean, I think the um, the Iran nuclear deal was making the world safer and was constraining Iran's ability to develop weapons. Um, everyone always said it didn't go far enough, but it was a first step and it was an important first step. And I was in meetings with Rex Tillerson when he was Secretary of State and came to London with, and Boris Johnson, where Boris Johnson was trying to convince Rex Tillerson that, mm -hmm. that the U.S. should not pull out of the agreement. And um, ultimately, the U.S. did. And I think Joe Biden is going to be certainly looking at um, re revitalizing that agreement, probably on a broader scale to address some of the other concerns about Iran. Um, but pulling out of the agreement did not make the world safer. Do you think then we heard from the Secretary of State for Defense just a few moments ago here suggesting that it doesn't really matter who is at the top, that the world is made unsafe by all the things that are going on, whether it's Russia aggression or Chinese aggression or whoever it is. Do, do you take that view or do you think the fact that the, the, the current president, President Trump, as he still currently is, do you think he and his attitude made the world a less safe place? I think absolutely he made the world less safe uh, through his sort of chaotic uh, policy formulation and the way that he um, made announcements uh, on Twitter without consulting with allies, um, it made the world less safe. And I think the world will be safer with the President Biden. Look, I think the U.S.-U.K. relationship has always been strong and will continue to be strong. The defense and intelligence and security work that we do together is vitally important for both countries. And the relationship at the very top is sort of icing on the cake. It can make it a little bit better. Um, but the work that goes on on a daily basis by the bureaucrats mm -hmm. and foreign service on both sides of the Atlantic um, is what really makes the relationship special. And that will continue. Lewis Lukens, great to speak to you. Thank you for your time this morning. Former acting U.S. ambassador to the U.K., former deputy chief of mission at the U.S. Embassy in London, now a senior partner with Signum Global Advisors. In just under 15 minutes, we will pause as a nation for two minutes to remember those who gave their lives in service of this country this Remembrance Sunday. And afterwards, we'll speak to Captain Sir Tom Moore, who will join the programme uh, after the news at 11 o'clock. It's 10.46. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. LBC. Going. Labour's biggest donors say they're ready to pull the plug over cash. Len McCluskey, the General Secretary of Unite, has defended the decision to cut its funding to the Labour Party. Going. Labour agree to support lockdown. Labour leader Sakir Starmer has voted with the government to back a second national lockdown. Lockdown. Gone. Jeremy Corbyn booted out of the party. Former Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn's been suspended by the party after his response to the anti-Semitism report. A lot for Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer to discuss in Call Keir. With me, Nick Ferrari, Monday morning from 9. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. The return of Call Keir. Put your questions to the leader of the Labour Party, LBC.
BBC Tom's Warbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick live from Westminster. We're live to the Cenotaph in just a few moments as uh, those that are allowed to the Cenotaph this year gather ahead of that Remembrance serv Sunday service. Let's come to Tony and Slough before we do. Hi there, Tony. Yeah, I think this American uh, relationship is a little bit of a myth. I mean, if you look at uh, Brexit um, prior to the... Mm -hmm. At, at the last <laughs> referendum, Brexit, when Obama came over, yes. um, we had him saying that we were going to be at the back of the queue. Yes. So, yeah, I, I, I can't see how this, um, this, you know, we've got this special relationship. I can't really see how it's, uh, you know, how has it manifested itself in what way? I mean, apart from Tony well, It manifests Blair. itself in a, in a huge number of ways. First of all, the commitment to Article 5 of NATO by the US, which guarantees the security of many European nations. You've got defence cooperation, you've got security cooperation. We work with American uh, spies around the world and American assets around the world to try and protect ourselves. We've been at war with America, notably on occasions that we're about to uh, pause to remember in just a few moments' time. I don't understand how you've missed the US-UK special relationship, Tony. Did that, did that apply when Tony Blair, when his w weapons of mass destruction then, did it? When there well, wasn't it, it, a, it, any it, weapons well, of mass destruction? Well, there weren't any. No, you're right. You're no, absolutely no, right. Exactly. There were not any. No. So we went in on a premise that didn't exist, but we went in yeah. with the United States. So yeah, exactly. I, I, yeah. you so, yeah, so you're I don't understand what you're suggesting. Think, well, what I'm saying is that I think Biden is bad for the UK. Um... I mean, we know conservatism is dead in the UK anyway. I mean, that's RIP, because there's no conservatives left in the Conservative Party. So I think he's going to have a, a, a massive influence on UK politics, especially over Brexit. Um, in, and that, you know, I think it's just going to drag on and make things worse for All us right. in the Tony, UK. thank you. Leave it there. Thank you, Tony. Here's Ian in South Woodford. Hi, Ian. Hi, Tom. Tom, Your it's thought, something sir. you said just before about with Donald Trump saying he was going to pull out of NATO, but wasn't it that he was going to pull out of NATO unless NATO pulled its weight and put more money in? It was if it was he, he was threatening around Article Five, which is the the language around coming to mutual aid if another European nation is is involved in an act of war, which the former Prime Minister Theresa May had to go over to Washington to get him to, to back. And yes, you're right, he has, as Obama did, asked for more nations to come in and put more money in and spend more on defence. And they have done. And also, yeah. And so that's, so that actually, he was, he was right in what he said. It's like, you can't sort of do something and expect every America to do it all for all for Threatening to blow else. it up? Threatening to blow it up huh? in order to get what you want? Is that the best way to do it? Well, I think he was sort of had to say something. We're not talking about a New York property deal here. We're talking about the, the safety and security of hundreds of millions of people. Well, the same thing can be said that quite simply, as you were saying just before, with the deals that he's done with the uh, states in the Middle East, he's trying to sort of push it that they've got to come to the table. Everybody has all the time said to the Palestinians, please come. Golda Meir mm -hmm. said they just wish Israel, that the Arabs would treat their kids the same way as the Israeli treat their kids. But they don't right, want to we'll know. Leave it, we'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for your call. Come to your calls in a few moments. But let's get down to Whitehall to the Cenotaph. James Goodison is our reporter who's there for us live this morning. Hi there, James. Hi, Tom. You can probably hear the band behind me already at the Cenotaph as we head towards 11 o'clock. But this service is going to be like any other we've seen in the 100 years that the Cenotaph has stood. Normally, there's thousands of people down here on Remembrance Sunday, veterans and family paying their respects to the dead. But this time, because of coronavirus, that isn't possible. Instead, there's around 150 armed service people representing their service branches here at the Cenotaph. I spoke to some of them about how it's different this year. I think it's really important that uh, we stay at home at this time. Um, it does feel very different. I would normally spend uh, Remembrance Sunday with my family at a local service, uh, remembering members of my family that previously served and my colleagues that are still serving around the world and in the UK today. Um, so today will be very different, but I think the important thing to remember is we can still remember those people that previously served um, at home and, and take that moment. This is my eighth eighth one of doing this and yes it's so totally totally surreal uh, just looking around Whitehall is empty apart from the press and the 
few of us that are lucky enough to be down here. But in in a different way, I think it's also more poignant, the fact that it is empty. That by being here and representing so many people, it's a little bit like representing those that didn't come back with the empty spaces and everything else like that. Um, something that's going to live with me for the rest of my life, I'll be down here on this special day. Now, the Prime Minister and leaders of the opposition are laying wreaths, of course, here on Remembrance Sunday. His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, is laying the wreath in place of Her Majesty the Queen. She's up on the balcony of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, draped in blue today. You can hear the band behind me. Of course, many people won't be able to go to services or marches up and down the country today. They're being encouraged to share their stories and their memories online instead. Tom. LBC's James Goodison reporting for us live down from down there uh, by the Cenotaph this morning, a morning where the, that service of remembrance is uh, changed, of course, because of the restrictions brought in as a result of the coronavirus crisis that we're all living through, a reminder again of just how different this year is uh, to the many hundreds of years that we have spent gathering at the Cenotaph uh, to remember those who have fallen. Um, we will pause uh, as a nation to remember them for two minutes just uh, after the news at 11 o'clock. And then after that, we'll speak to Captain Sir Tom Moore, who, of course, uh, did so much through the coronavirus crisis to raise that money that has helped NHS charity, someone who served during the Second World War as well. We will speak to Captain Sir Tom after the news at 11. We will hear, too, from the Secretary of State for Defence, Ben Wallace, who uh, was also ser served in the armed forces in Northern Ireland and around in other places as well, around the world in other places. We will hear from him, too, about, about veterans, about the impact that the government is having on helping those veterans, uh, and about the future of the armed forces, given the government is now engaged in a review of the um, the budget for the MOD as well as the efficacy of the military and what it could be doing in the future to help to try and protect uh, this country. So we will hear from the Secretary of State, Ben Wallace, after the news at 11 o'clock. So in just a few moments, as you know, uh, we will unite in two minutes of silence to make sure that no one who served uh, for this country is forgotten and to remember and honour those who have sacrificed themselves to secure and protect our freedom. And boy, in this year, uh, do we not value those freedoms that they served and died for. Let's go live to Global's newsroom. Here's Holly Harris. From Global's newsroom at just before 11 o'clock. It's Remembrance Sunday, a time to honour all those who've suffered or died in war. This year, the traditional commemorations have been impacted by COVID-19, with restrictions on ceremonies and parades. But veterans are still encouraging us to pause and reflect from our doorsteps, none more so than Captain Sir Tom Moore. Everyone must take their part in the remembrance. We can't gather in, in great numbers, but the spirit is there and next year maybe we can all get together again and all the thousands of people who walk past the cenotaph will be able to do that again because it is so important remembering the people who gave their lives a limited ceremony is being held at the cenotaph in london where we'll now join members of the royal family the prime minister and veterans for a two-minute silence
two minute silence to mark Remembrance Sunday. In other news this morning, the Defence Secretary has told LBC he is confident that Britain and the US will continue to enjoy a close relationship when Joe Biden moves into the White House. The Democrats have been named the President-elect after almost four days of counting votes. Boris Johnson is among the world leaders to send his congratulations. And speaking to Swarbrick on Sunday, Ben Wallace has denied Mr Johnson's previous close relationship with Donald Trump could cause a problem. The American presidents know that one of the countries around the world that share their values of democracy, of open society, of free trade, uh, is the United Kingdom. That's what will unite us. And the United Kingdom looks forward to getting down to business with President-elect Joe Biden. We've had a good relationship with President Trump and will continue to do so until that power transitions. Donald Trump is yet to concede the election and has instructed his lawyers to take his claims of vote rigging to the courts. Shadow International Trade Secretary Emily Thornbury has told LBC she's more optimistic for global relations with the Republican on his way out. I think that can't be overstated how much safer we are now. I think the the truth is, is that Donald Trump was always a disruptor. He always just wanted to smash things up and see what would happen next. And you just can't do that with the world order. Many other world leaders have been sending messages of congratulations to the new president-elect, among them Angela Merkel, Emmanuel Macron and President Moon Jae-in of South Korea. Russian President Vladimir Putin, who was on, we had a friendly relationship with Donald Trump, is yet to formally acknowledge the win. The weather, cloudy across the UK with some rain in the west, which will be heavy in places. The best of the brightness in northern Scotland, a high of 14 Celsius. From Global's Newsroom, I'm Holly Harris. is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Very good morning to you. Four minutes past 11 is the time you're listening to Swarbrick on Sunday here on LBC, which you can, of course, watch on Global Player, on Twitter, on Facebook, on our YouTube channels as well. It's good to be with you this Sunday morning, a morning where we have paused to mark our respect to those who gave their lives in service of this country. And we will speak in a few moments to someone who has given such service to his country during the Second World War. Captain Sir Tom Moore is due to join us on the programme a little bit later on. Um, it is, of course, not, not only are we seeing the changes uh, to politics across the world and specifically across the Atlantic with the election of Joe Biden, uh, but we also get to do that uh, pause where we can stop and take stock of, of not only those who have given their lives and, and the way in which they did that, but frankly, in a year that has seen such utter turmoil, chaos and tragedy for so many, it is at least a moment that we can uh, come together and unite around in this difficult time. We'll talk more about coronavirus, about the lockdown that's due to lift in Wales later on in the programme. But I want to start this hour by speaking again to the Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, the Secretary of State for Defence, Conservative MP for Weir and Preston North, about the Remembrance Service today. And of course, what it means to him, not only as Defence Secretary, but also as a forming serving member of the armed forces. I think of really the men that I served with. Um, I did nearly 10 years in the army and I think of uh, the men in, of the Scots Guards. I think of my platoon, my companies, um, and then all the operations that we went on. In, in my, for me, it was Northern Ireland. Um, and I think of the camaraderie. Uh, I think of the dark sides that sometimes we witnessed when, for example, we'd have a soldier murdered or there were attacks. But, but that's what I think about overall. And then I think of those that didn't come back from some of these tours. Mm. I, I wonder if... Um... Again, you, you, you talk about the, the service that you provided in, in 1992 when you were in Northern Ireland. I wonder if you, do you, uh, having given that service and seen, seen action in that way, do you struggle with dealing with that? I mean, there's people talk about PTSD, people talk about the stresses and strains of having been in the armed, armed forces and seeing combat in that fashion. Is that something that you've struggled with previously? I, I haven't. Um, I, I look back on it with the fondest memories. Um, I felt fulfilled. I felt I was doing something that helped bring 
uh, peace and stability and and defending those that couldn't defend themselves. And um, that was not only in 92, in 1994, I was out there at the very time the IRA committed to its first ceasefire. And, uh, you know, that was amazing for, for, for troops who had often uh, been under threat, but also been there to try and uh, bring stability. So I, th I think for me, I, I'm uh, very lucky. I don't, but everyone deals with their experiences in different ways. And, you know, I think it's been a really good thing that over the last sort of decade and, and certainly recently that this government through the Office of Veterans Affairs has committed and invested even more into mental health uh, plans for uh, veterans and, and other mm. schemes to make sure that we have forces champions and things like that. We obviously come uh, uh, together again as a nation to to remember <coughs> this morning, but in very, very different circumstances to what people have previously experienced, um, given that services have been um, put online and that there will be far fewer people around the Cenotaph this morning. I saw that the former Prime Minister said in the House of Commons earlier this week um, when she talked about a service at Worcester Cathedral having to be live streamed, pre-recorded and live streamed, she said, surely those men and women who lay down their lives for our freedoms deserve better than this. I wonder if you agree. Well, I don't know the details of individual services. The, the guidelines that we put out said, look, that it was up to local authorities to help and assist remembering services if it could uh, observe social distancing and take place outside. Because, of course, we do value our veterans. Uh, some of them are very elderly, and we want to make sure that uh, we protect them from this COVID uh, outbreak. This is a not a permanent thing. This is this is for now, uh, and there are ways that people can uh, mark the occasion, either in their own space at home or in their silence, or indeed, you know, if the local authority has planned a way to do that at, at those remembrance events. But I think I think it is important that we remember we are trying to get on top of COVID, uh, and that means large mm. public gatherings inside and outside don't help if, if we allow them to happen. You, you, um, you talk about your pride in the armed forces and in, in your own service in the armed forces. I wonder then if you are going to be the Secretary of State that, that gets rid of tanks in the British armed forces, as has been reported from this, this integrated review. Are you going to do that? You're going to get rid of the British Army of tanks? No. Um, it was a very interesting article, um, but the simple reality is we're not cancelling tanks. And what we are going to do, uh, dependent on our integrated review negotiations and the integrated review, but we are going to make sure that the equipment our soldiers have reflect the threat of today. And there are lessons that we have to learn from what we see around the world with, for example, the use of Turkish UAVs in uh, Libya and Syria uh, that are destroying hundreds of tanks. We have to learn those lessons and make sure we have an army ready to fight tomorrow's war, not an army uh, set on fighting yesterday's war. You talk about negotiations about the integrated review. Um, how are you finding negotiations with the Treasury about getting the money in place to provide this equipment? You, you smile. Well, because I, you know, I, I negotiate with the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister and I discuss uh, how we're going to uh, meet his aspirations for Global Britain, and I obviously talk to him about the challenges within defence. It's not a secret that defence has a £13 billion black hole uh, that has grown really up over the last 15 years, uh, and the National Audit Office has made that clear. So. Uh, we're in a discussion. Uh, the Prime Minister understands the need for investment in our armed forces and obviously the budget is in a few weeks' time, so let's see where we get to. But you, don't, you, you can't have a forward-facing uh, review of integrated services within the armed forces without having the money there. It would be pointless. Well, I think we're in the middle of a negotiation. Um, you know, the Treasury has said that on most of its spending, it's going to be on a single year because it wants, understandably, the Chancellor says, you know, look what's happening in COVID, the global economy has shrunk, uh, what are we really going to have to spend? Mm -hmm. uh, and I understand that position. Uh, and then, of course, defence is a very long-term project, you know, the F-35 or the Typhoon, the Eurofighter that are, are made, for example, in Lancashire, you know, they are 20, 30-year sure. projects. So. You know, but it's a long-term project, project that, with a short-term budget here. So how, how well, effective it, it, is this going to be? Well, we had one last year and we got a generous settlement, a, a really generous settlement from the Treasury to meet last year's one-year uh, uh, settlement. Um, that allowed us to get to this point. Um, there comes a time when eventually we want a long-term settlement. We think it's really important. Any government department that has a capital programme, whether that's transport or 
uh, the police or in the, you know, the Home Office or indeed us. They always like, we always like long term programs because that gives everyone stability uh, to plan. Um, that's not a, a new tension. I don't know if you remember when Gordon Brown introduced multi year spending reviews, the Treasury fought it tooth and nail at one stage because you know, a, a Treasury has more power on a year by year negotiation than it does over a three or four years. So uh, we, we'll get there. I, I, I'm confident we'll get there. You know, the Prime Minister understands that global Britain is about projecting Britain around the world. One of the, the best exports we have is British defence policy, British defence uh, support, as in British forces around mm-hmm. the world helping our friends and protecting our interests, and British defence exports, uh, which employ hundreds of thousands of people up and down the country. He understands that. Uh, and I think we've still got some time to run. Just very finally on this, before we come to how the world is changing and certainly changed over the last few days, um, I, I saw your appearance in front of uh, MPs in the Defence Select Committee. And I think it's perhaps something that we've seen throughout COVID here, the, the way in which society, the whole of society, has acted as a line of defence, certainly for various people, actually, during the COVID crisis. You've talked about having a whole of society response being required to defence, that the Scandi countries are better at articulating a whole of a whole of society resilience. What do you mean by that? Well, because our adversaries often operate below the threshold of armed conflict. You know, they don't they don't go to violence. They use cyber, they use electronic warfare, they use, uh, in the case, for example, in the Russians, they've been using cyber crime as groups of people. The, the Foreign Office recently called out the Drydex a group of uh, offenders who are the ones often sending the emails to you and me with, uh, you know, cyber fraud. And so they use a whole range of uh, methods and tools to weaken our countries. Um, And, you know, people often think of defence and security in a very traditional area, such as, you know, tanks and espionage and spies. But actually, uh, what we see with disinformation, what we see with corruption, what we see with you know, money laundering, uh, and what we see with cybercrime is right across society. Mm. And, and the way we're going to make those adversaries less successful is by a whole collective understanding that everyone has a part to play. Cyber is one of the best examples of that. Uh, when we see cyber attacks against either government organisations or commercial organisations, sometimes it's happened not because of some very sophisticated attack by a, a sort of uh, you know a foreign type of GCHQ, but because. Uh, somebody hasn't had good cyber hygiene, as they call it. They've imported the virus uh, because they haven't followed their own IT rules. And I think that's the point about we make our society harder to be subverted if we do it together. And that's why security minister, we did it across the board with the National Crime Agency, police, counterterrorism, education, local authorities Mm. to prevent radicalization. And that's what I mean. And other countries are better at doing that sometimes. That's the Secretary of State of Defence, Ben Wallace, Conservative MP for Weir and Preston North, speaking to me a little bit earlier this morning, uh, just before the service of remembrance took place down there on Whitehall. Um, Text on 84850 when it comes to the American election here. Tom certainly looks as if Trumpism is here to stay and may come around even stronger next time. Uh, Tom, please stop giving Trump's claims credibility. It is all opinion at present. Well, it is. He's trying to bring those cases uh, to courts to claim electoral fraud, but at the moment hasn't got any grounds on which to, to claim it whatsoever. He's still tweeting away from the White House saying that he won. He, of course, did not. We'll come on to your thoughts in just a few moments and we'll speak to Captain Sir Tom Moore as well this Remembrance Sunday. Swarbrick on Sunday on LBC. It's 11.15. This is LBC.
Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Very good morning to you. 11.18 is the time. Tom Swarbrick here on LBC, where I am delighted to say that we are joined this morning by Captain Sir Tom Moore, Second World War Army veteran and fundraiser extraordinaire, and by his daughter, Hannah Ingram Moore, uh, who is the spokesperson for the Captain Tom Foundation. It is wonderful to see you both this morning. Thank you so much for being there. Uh, Sir Tom, um, I wonder, first of all, as you pause for that silence again this morning, who it is that immediately comes to your mind, sir? As you pause this morning, who immediately comes to your mind? Today, today was a very special day. For every year, I remembered uh, all those who died previously. But today, I was uh, I was having special thoughts for those who had been my immediate friends, who had given their lives, and uh, those who have since died. Uh, afterwards, it was it's a great thought that those people gave their lives for our country, and they gave it quite willingly. To me, today is a very, a very special day, remembering all those people of all different nations who have given their lives in. in for their country and they gave it quite cheerfully and they gave it with, with honour. For all those people who gave their lives, I must say, thank you very much. You are very great people. I couldn't have put it any better, Sir Tom. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you to you too for your service. You, you talk about it being done willingly. I wonder whether there was any part of you that resented or was angry about having to um, put your life on hold to go and, and, and fight in a way that presumably you couldn't have imagined. So you say that every, uh, everyone fought willingly. Do you, is there any part of you that ever resented or was angry with having to fight for your country in terrible circumstances? And no, never ever was I had any anti-feeling against my country. I was fighting not only my country, but everyone that I knew who were all great, great people, all my family and all my best friends, I was fighting for them and never ever was there any ill feeling or hatred to anyone who I was fighting for or fighting with. And sir, do you mind me asking if you were ever, as a, as a young man fighting in that fashion, were you ever scared? I mean, did, it, did, that, did that feeling ever emerge or were you just dealing with the job at hand? When you were fighting, especially in those atrocious circumstances in Burma, were you ever scared or were you just dealing with what you had to deal with? And to say well, was I scared, no, I was never scared. <laughs> I've said before, at 22, you're not the sort of people who get scared. But what I was fighting for was I felt was a good cause and it was for so many other people who were not in a position to to fight and those, all, all those people at, at home who were waiting there cheerfully was having an, an awful time thinking of all their great friends there all their loved ones who were out there giving their lives on behalf of all those people mm. at home. I, I couldn't imagine not being anything other than absolutely terrified in those circumstances, to be honest with you, Sir Tom. Um, Hannah, to you, on, on, on the campaign, um, I wonder how much, as well as the campaign to raise money, has been a, such an unbelievable success. I wonder whether there's uh, a part of you that wants to now move on to talking about uh, veterans or the work that we heard from Ben Wallace the government is doing to try and get more money into the armed forces. Yeah, I think our original fundraising was was simply something that started as a, a family nugget uh, of to spread a bit of joy and ended up at thirty eight point nine million pounds in three and a half weeks Incredible. for an amazing cause. <laughs> I mean, 
utterly incredible. Seven months later, we've broken 800 interviews and in that time have set up the Captain Tom Foundation, got a registered charity, put trustees around the board, got our vision, our mission and our causes. And we um, sit around the table in absolute belief that we want to use the voice we've been given for powerfully good things. And yes, um, always at the centre of everything we're doing is recognising uh, veterans um, and the people who fought for our freedom. And I think it's incredibly important for us to remember that, which is why we nominated the Royal British Legion as one of the charities that we'd work with. Mm. Before I let you go, Sir Tom, um, perhaps for a spot of lunch this Sunday, uh, this Sunday morning, let me just ask you about what your friends and peers who you served with in, in Burma would have made of you now having been knighted and, and meeting the Queen and gaining this sort of national attention. What, what would they have said to you, do you think? So when you think now of everything that's happened over the last seven months, the knighthood, meeting the Queen, all the amazing honours, what would your friends who you served with in Burma have thought, said now if they'd been here? I think at the time they would have said, don't be, don't be so funny, things like that aren't going to happen. Uh, we're, we're all in this, to, in this together and we're, we're all comrades, but talking about things like that, don't be such a joke. <laughs> Things don't happen like that. They'd have said, don't be so daft, wouldn't they? I think. Yes. Don't be crazy. Absolutely. So you're, you're, gonna, you're having a funny turn. <laughs> Sir Tom, it is a genuine pleasure to speak to you uh, at any time, particularly on, on this particular Sunday morning. Thank you so much for your time. I'll let you go and have a cup of tea. Captain Sir Tom Moore, Second World War Army veteran, of course, fundraiser extraordinaire. And thank you to you, Hannah, as well, his daughter, Hannah Ingram Moore, daughter of Captain Sir Tom, spokesperson for the Captain Tom Foundation. Wonderful to see you, sir. Thank you very much indeed for your time on LBC this morning. Terrific. I just, can you be, imagine being anything other than utterly terrified by having to fight in, in, well, anywhere, frankly, during the Second World War, let alone in Burma, where the fighting was absolutely horrific. Uh, we'll come on to your thoughts as well about um, the, what Ben Wallace has said, the Secretary of State for Defence, telling us on the programme this morning about the, the future of the armed forces and whether the money is going to be there to provide them with the funding they need to protect us in the years ahead, and where, indeed whether the world is a safer place now that Joe Biden is the President-elect. 0345 is my number. Let's come to Evan, who's in Slough this morning. Hi there, Evan. Uh, hi, Tom. Um, I, I do think the world will be safer. I think there will be a return to a president in the White House. I think um, Trump has seen the U.S. wreck up debt and recovering economy. He's divided the U.S. He's made a complete disaster of COVID-19. He's boasted about groping women and suggested that injecting bleach as a cure for COVID-19. And, and Biden marks the end of the Trump reality show that has normalized lying and portrayed the position of president as a petty bully that appeals to sycophant yes men and corruption. Um, Biden is extremely experienced and he's a president for all U.S. citizens and someone I believe that can bring the U.S. the, the country back together. And I think more than listen, anything... I, I, yeah, listen, I agree with you that the, the further sort of denigration of the office of president is... It is hopefully no longer going to happen, um, given that Joe Biden, a man of uh, enormous experience and clearly of some uh, character, is, is now going to be in there. But it's very easy to dismiss with Trump the Trumpism that has seen 70 million Americans vote for him. Um, and actually, I think one of the successes of the Biden campaign has to be not to shun those people that voted for Trump, but to try and find ways of appealing to them to bring about this coalition of voters, which has seen in certain parts of the United States more middle-aged, middle-class white men voting for Joe Biden uh, than had previously voted for Donald Trump. That's the way to do it, isn't it? Not to just dismiss the people who vote for Trump. No, absolutely. You definitely do not want to dismiss the people that, that vote for Trump. And that's the point. Biden has to be a, a president for everyone. But you cannot normalise lines do that, in the though? White House. I mean, how does he do that? Particularly with, and Evan, there are some parallels, I think, with the Labour Party and particularly the, the Corbynite left of the Labour Party here, who you can, you can see from some of the, the words of some outriders of that particular part of the Labour Party, they seem to be quite angry that Joe Biden has been able to win from a centre-left platform. I, I, well, Joe Biden ha is much more centre ground, and I think he's had to be in order to tackle Trump. But um, mm. I think what he brings back to the stage, as I said, is a return to a president to the White House. I think Trump has really undermined that position. And I think that really has, um, I don't think anybody in the U.S. appreciates. And I think around the world, there's a sense of relief um, that, that, that that has come to an end. Mm. What would you say, though, to 
uh, a Trump supporter, either in this country or the US, who is in a form of mourning uh, about the loss of the president from the White House, who sees their safety actually being compromised by someone who isn't Donald Trump being in there. How do you persuade people that that, that Joe Biden is going to be a president for all the United people in the United States? Because it's an easy thing to say. It's a very difficult thing to actually do. I think first and foremost, we need to appreciate that we are, we're all on the same side. Everybody in the U.S. is on the same side. They're all on the side of what's best for the country. And I think that is what needs to be um, remembered. We're in a democracy, and we need to support that democracy. And I think in, in, democracy is about everyone being informed and educated and being honest with... But with, does, does, does the saving of democracy not also rely on democracy being done fairly and squarely? And if the president does have claims about illegality, they absolutely need to be heard? Or are we saying now that we've, the world's moved on now, that they, they don't matter anymore, those claims don't matter? I, I really think that, um, uh, Trump has been divisive in that respect. I mean, Biden's mandate is expected to be something like 306 to 229. And Biden's also won the popular vote, which is something Trump has never done. I mean, don't yep. get me wrong, Trump has every right um, to, to follow the legality on that. But he is being extremely divisive. Evan, good to talk to you. Thank you for the call. 0345 6060 973 is my number. We'll get some more reaction from the United States. A former advisor to Bernie Sanders on his 2016 presidential campaign. Interesting to see whether there is uh, a chance for Biden to bring the left of his party with him as he governs from the centre and whether their parallels can be made with the Labour Party about whether Keir Starmer can bring the left with him as he attempts to try and get into a position where he can govern from the centre. That looks incredibly hard uh, with, with certain figures of that, notably Jeremy Corbyn now being on the outside of the Labour Party. 0345 6060 is my number. Come to your calls a bit later on. Tom Swarbrick here on LBC. It's 11.30. Let's get some news headlines this Sunday morning. Holly Harris. The Defence Secretary has told LBC the British government is looking forward to getting down to business with the next President of the United States, Joe Biden. The Democrats have been named President-elect with 279 electoral votes and some ballots still to be counted. Donald Trump is planning to fight the decision in the courts. He's instructed his legal team to file a number of lawsuits alleging vote rigging, but has as yet failed to provide any evidence. A two-minute silence has been held for Remembrance Sunday to honour all those who fought and died in war. A scaled-back, socially distanced ceremony has been held at the Cenotaph, attended by the Prime Minister, Prince William and the Queen. The weather, cloudy across the UK with some rain in the west, which will be heavy in places. The best of the brightness in northern Scotland, a high of 14 Celsius. This is LBC.
Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Call 0345 6060973. Morning to you. 11.34 is the time. We'll talk about the COVID gravy train, which seems to be in full flow right now. Big story on the front of the Sunday Times this morning. Vaccine SAR runs up £670,000 PR bill. Uh, this is the head of the government's vaccine task force who is alleged to have charged the taxpayer um, way more than nearly three quarters of a million quid for a team of boutique public relations consultants. Kate Bingham is a venture capitalist and, like some of the others who have now been put into these plum jobs to help manage coronavirus, married to a Conservative MP. We'll discuss that after the news at 12. Let's reflect more on Joe Biden's victory. Aran Chowdhury joins us, former creative director of Bernie Sanders' 2016 presidential campaign. He also worked on Barack Obama's 2008 presidential campaign and was the videographer of the White House from 2009 to 2011. What a job that must have been. Aaron, thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning. Um, first of all, your thoughts on Joe Biden governing from the centre? I mean, I think this is Joe Biden's instincts. I, uh, you know, I got to work a lot with him when he was at the White House, and he is definitely somebody who sort of shoots from an emotional place, from a place of deep empathy and deep compassion. But I do think his political instincts are to dive towards the center. They aren't necessarily a big transformational change. Uh, but he does have an opportunity, just like becoming Barack Obama's vice president, to sort of reinvent himself in a third way. Uh, and I hope that he listens to folks who are going to push him in those directions. Yeah, so this is, um, I, I guess you say he's not going to be transformative in the sense that you might have wanted a Bernie Sanders uh, president to be. Um, do you think he is going to be able to take much of the left with him, much of people such as yourself who are very supportive of Bernie Sanders' agenda? Do you think he's going to be able to do that or is that going to be a constant source of a friction for him? It's going to be a constant source of friction, but whether or not that's good friction or bad friction is what we need to see. You know, sometimes it's a grain of sand that makes the uh, the pearl, right? Uh, so I, I do think you saw, like in a, in the Obama administration, that you know folks who really agitated the White House with concrete plans relentlessly, like I'll give you an example of the LGBT community, uh, yeah. got you know more of the things on their agenda they wanted than others. So I think you will see very concerted effort to to push Biden here, but. Let's be totally clear, like this election it, in many ways, you know, showed how divisive America was. It was not a huge victory. The Democrats lost a, a couple House seats. None, none of the state legislatures moved. But one thing that was unifying from Republicans in Florida, you know, all the way to Democrats in Nebraska was actually a series of progressive issues that are very popular, whether it's Medicare for all, whether it's a Green New Deal, a lot of these what some traditional Republicans and moderate Democrats treat as boogeyman scary issues are sure. actually immensely popular with both fans the of Green Trump New and Deal, the, the Green New Deal, the two trillion dollars that Joe Biden is, has been talking about to invest in, in climate saving energy. The politics of that is so far ahead of the reality of actually being able to do it. And if he's got a problem with actually being able to get this stuff done through a split Senate, if the Republicans control the Senate, he's going to have to explain to an awful lot of disappointed Democrats on the left that he can't quite do the things that he is desperate to do or wants to do because of the politics of it. There is a unique Joe Biden solution here, though, that I don't know he'll employ, but maybe he'll hear our conversation and get on it, which is to use those connections, that empathy and that desire to reach across the aisle to actually make the Green New Deal, rather than a spectacular New Deal federal project, a series of state projects. Because, you know, a local state rep in, in Georgia, uh, you know, or in Idaho is going to have a hard time explaining why mm -hmm. they don't want jobs. Uh, and why we're going to send those jobs to China because they don't want yeah. a solar panel factory in their town. Let me just ask you briefly and finally, you must have, I presume, come across or worked with Tommy Vitor, former Obama press aide, worked in the uh, national security setup there, uh, someone I've interviewed a couple of times um, on my programme. Uh, he described Boris Johnson as a shape-shifting creep, adding, we will never forget your racist comments about Obama and slavish devotion to Trump. The suggestion is, in the papers here, that people around Kamala Harris remember what Boris Johnson said about Barack Obama, and they didn't like it then and they don't like it now. Do you think that's going to be a problem for the Prime Minister? 
I mean, Donald Trump had a very small international gang and uh, Boris Johnson was definitely a conspicuous member of it. In many of our satirical comedy programs, Boris Johnson was just sort of seen as an oafish friend of, of Donald Trump. So I do think he's gonna have a, a big pit to dig his way out of in terms of relationship with liberals and the left in the US because he just, for better and for worse now, is associated with Trumpism, if not with Donald mm. Trump. Aaron, great to speak to you. Thank you very much indeed, Aaron Chowdhury, former creative director of Bernie Sanders' uh, 2016 campaign, involved in the 2008 Obama campaign, and of course in the White House for two years between 2009 and 2011. Let's speak to Jessica, who's in Cheddar this morning. Hi, Jessica. Hi, good morning. Hi. I, I just wanted to, you know, just put something positive out here, because I do, in my heart, feel very strongly that Trump did so many good things. He's often referred to as a warmonger. He didn't want take America into war, but he created more peaceful relationships with overseas countries like North Korea. I think there was a Middle uh, East Treaty quite recently. And all of the wonderful things that he managed to put into place, there hasn't ever been any real recognition for that. The media well, has... Well, see, Jessica, I, I, think, I think actually what we're talking about here is um, what happened on the surface versus what happened underneath. So yeah, he, he spoke to Kim Jong-un and, and yeah, they had a summit together and yeah, they talked about being great friends and, and everything else. And that on the face of it is quite good. What's actually happened though is that North Korea has continued unabated to enrich uranium and build nuclear weapons. How's that a success? Well, no, but at least he tried. At least he hasn't gone in with massive Well, that's, that's not good. I'm sorry, but when we're talking about the the safety of the world from a despot who might, at the flick of a switch, fire a nuclear weapon towards LA or any other part of the Western world, just trying isn't really, isn't going to cut it, is it? No, just trying is, is but then again, um, at least he didn't go in all guns blazing and immediately start threatening him with war. about fire and fury. He talked about fire and fury. He, he threatened him at, over at Twitter. Beginning. And he goes in hard, but then he, he tends to sort of, in the end, sort of like create a, more of a human relationship. I mean, I, I haven't got any... That's, and Jessica, I, don't, I, th I think I you're right about that, by the way. That is a classic negotiating tactic, isn't it? You go in very hard, you throw it all up in the air, you say you're going to walk away and you're going to tear everything up. Then you start to build uh, the personal relationship to bring about the thing that you needed. And he did all the things that you've talked about, apart from getting the thing that was needed. <laughs> if anything, it's got worse. Well, I think that's more the state of the world that we're in. I mean, if you look at what happened with in Washington, you know, having to board up the entire city because of fear um, with what would happen if Trump had actually got in. And something like that would never happen from the Republicans. You know, they tend to be much more peaceful. I mean, as it is now, you know, that, that they aren't going around smashing up things because it's not so much in their nature. And um, right. well, I think that's... I'm not sure you can judge all Republicans and all their nature in one go, but Jessica, I appreciate the attempt. Thank you very much indeed. Let's turn to Julian, Julian Zeilzer, who is a historian at Princeton University and a CNN political analyst. Thank you very much for coming on the programme this morning, uh, Julian. Um, your thoughts on what, on what Jessica was saying there about the efficacy of the Trump presidency. How, how is history going to remember that, do you think? Well, there's certain places in which I think his uh, influence is significant. Certainly in the Supreme Court of the United States, he's helped to create a 6-3 voting block for conservatives that's consequential and it won't be eliminated in any time soon. Uh, he also pushed through pretty significant cuts uh, in the tax tax rate and pushed through many deregulations on the environment that again will not be easy for uh, President-elect Biden to undo. So uh, there was a lot that happened in four years and this will be part of the uh, agenda for Democrats to uh, try to reverse some of this and also to clean up many of the problems with the administration's mm -hmm. failed pandemic policies. Yeah, we'll come on to that a bit later. I was talking to my, my previous guest about the difficulties Joe Biden might have of bringing the left of the Democrat Party along with him as he governs from the centre um, in a, a, what might be a much more collaborative but therefore much more compromised way. Do you, do you see that as, uh, as being more effective perhaps than what Trump was doing or are we going to end up with an American government that is um, stagnant? 
Well, I think if anyone was fit for this role, it's Joe Biden. He spent much of his time uh, in his career in the Senate, so he's used to the politics of compromise and negotiation. Uh, I think the left uh, will but is still compromise support what people Biden. who voted for him want, Mr. Mr. Zal- Zalizar. Is that is that what people want from? They want to kind of compromise on the one hand this, but on the other hand that kind of presidency, or is the well, change that Americans are crying out for not going to be able to be delivered right now? It's not all his choice. I mean, he he might face a, a Republican Senate, which already will check what he can do. Uh, But there are certain issues in which I think he can bridge the left and the moderate part of the Democratic Party on issues involving the pandemic, involving an economic stimulus, even involving the environment. There's a lot of broad areas of consensus where you can certainly unite the Democratic Party and on the economic stimulus, for example, potentially pick off a little bit of Republican support. Of course, he might have a, a Democratic Senate, in which case the whole story changes. Yeah. And just finally on the Republican Party, what, what, what does Mitch McConnell, what do the big, uh, big wigs in the Republican Party do with a furious, uh, spitting feathers Donald Trump? Oh, I, I think their agenda will remain the same. Uh, I think they will try to use that anger that he brings to the party as a way to energize Republican voters. And now he will not have formal political power. So he can yell and scream. He can't influence what Senator McConnell does. Uh, but they will not ignore him. He, he pulled almost 70 million votes and his support remains a formidable part of the Republican Party. In the end, I don't think there's a huge divergence between what a Senator Mitch McConnell wants and what a Donald Trump wants. And, and so I think they, too, can be comfortable uh, with having Trump as part of the Republican Party. Great to have you on this morning. Julian Zalazar, historian at Princeton University, CNN political analyst. Thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. If you are a big Corbynite, you're a big fan of Jeremy Corbyn, you wanted him to win in 2017, you went out and campaigned for him in 2019, I don't know, you, you absolutely love the guy, you love his politics. Do you see Keir Starmer as an opportunity to actually make that happen because Keir Starmer could, in theory, become prime minister? Or do you see Keir Starmer as a block on delivering the policies you wanted Jeremy Corbyn to deliver that were, in your view, so popular? That, I think, is is the question that is facing a lot of left-leaning Democrats uh, right now. Can you govern effectively in the, and bring about the change that people on the left want to see from a position on the centre? Um, A lot of people are very angry with Keir Starmer, certainly on the left, are very angry with Keir Starmer about the way in which he has handled the left of the party, suspending Jeremy Corbyn as he has over the last few weeks, and whether his, whatever policies he has about various issues, are going to be as transformative as, as Jeremy Corbyn's. Or are we now saying, with the election of Joe Biden, you just can't win? Whether it's the US or the UK, you're never going to win from a position very far on the left. You've always got to govern from the centre because that's where the majority of people are. It's what Tony Blair always said. You always win from the centre. 0345 6060 973 is my number. Come to your calls in a few moments. Tom Swarbrick, 1147. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. LBC. Business and industry minister and obviously Conservative MP Nadim Zahawi. What is the population of Liverpool, do you imagine? I think it's 1.7 million, I think. You'd actually buy, you'll be all right with around 500,000, by the way. So why should I believe any number? The death toll graphs were wrong. Two of the key advisors from whom Boris Johnson takes a lot of advice, accidentally whatever, presented figures that were wrong and they've now been downgraded. Why should my listeners have confidence in anything? This is like the work of a primary school child. What are you using? Abacuses? Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Week Day mornings from 7 LBC.
This is LBC Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick. Live from Westminster. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Here's Leslie on Twitter, at LBC Tom. A Biden victory means more money for Iran and Rocket Man will start the fireworks again, says Leslie. But Rocket Man... <laughs> Rocket Man. Uh, he, he didn't stop. It wasn't like Trump... Oh, great, Trump met him in, in Singapore and then they had that f- handshake across the border in, in North Korea. Those were big moments. They were great on TV. It maybe m- could have made a rapprochement easier. But underneath it... He's kept going, Kim Jong-un. He's had these weapons display. He's he's still enriching the uranium. The substance of it hasn't really changed. The style of it, sure, completely different, unique, astonishing. Is the world safer as a result? Don't think so. Here's Paul in Western Supermare. Hi there, Paul. Hi, Tom. Your thoughts, sir? Hi, then. Yes, um, I wanted to call about, um, talk about people something that people are really not talking about, which is the, uh, uh, well... All the, all the mainstream media are singing from the same hymn sheet that Biden's won and Trump's a loser and that sort of stuff. Uh, it appears that there is a massive, massive uh, voter fraud that's happened in the United States. Um, some districts have had 200% turnout, which is a mathematical impossibility. Others have had 100% turnout with 100% votes for Biden. Um, and there is talk of a, a software called Hammer and Scorecard, which has been used to uh, digital, digitally um, manoeuvre the vote, basically, in, in favour of Joe Biden. Okay, Paul, um, I'm going to stop you there. Want... Go I, yeah. yeah, Paul, I'm going to stop you there because, uh, first of all, where have you found this all from? Uh, various different sources, really. Various different sources. Like which? Um, which, which sources? Uh, well, it can it can be. Uh, there's Judicial Watch in America, which is uh, which is uh, um, a uh, well-known organisation that watches you know what goes on in government and that sort of stuff, mm-hmm. and uh, that things are fair. This has not been a fair election at all in any way. Shape no, but sorry, or form. You, but on on the basis of these the the claims that you are making about 200% turnout and allegations yeah. that that um, that the machines changed the vote. Yes. Where are you Hammer getting this from? Because at, the, because at the moment, the President of the United Homeland, States is not making these... Is, hang on a sec, Paul. The Homeland, President of the United Homeland. States is not making the claims that you are making. He is not saying we're going to court with this evidence that these machines changed the vote. There was also um, a... Uh, Homeland no, no, just don't, don't tell me about also. Don't tell me about also. Tell me about the claim okay, that you sure, have sure. made that you have seen. Um, well, basically, there's there's a uh, the, uh, the what's the name? I can't think of the name. Uh, she, uh, basically, she's uh, what's her name? The name's gone now. Can't but she you. appeared on on Fox News. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. Sam, I can't think of the name now. Appeared on Fox News, and she said that they had used the the, uh, the Hammer and Scorecard software to manipulate the vote, basically by three percent, which would make right, a huge difference. Right. So we've difference. got a lady. You can't. You, for whatever reason, I, I realize Paul is a Sunday morning. Hang on. Give me a second. I'll find her name. But it's a lady on Fox who says this, that and the other about the scorecard voting system. Now, Trump and his legal team have launched a legal battle in Pennsylvania claiming that the voter registration of a particular part of Pennsylvania was apparently out of date and that there were 21,000 deceased people on this voter registration system. Now, that may or may not be true, but it does not say that those people then voted, that dead people somehow voted, and that the dead people voted for Joe Biden. At the moment, it's just the tidiness of a vote, voter registration system. All the things you have talked about, if there's evidence for it, let's see it, let's hear it, let's have the president bring it forward, let's have his legal team bring it forward. Paul, I hate to break it to you, I'm mate, sure they you will see, I'm sure you will see that in the next, in the next week, coming weeks, you'll what see that. What gives you such confidence? One one. What, got, what um, gives you such confidence in that? Because at the moment, you're, you're, you're grasping at thin air. You know, there's, there's uh, nothing not really. there. No, you've, it's, got, it's, you've got a Democrat you himself coming out, <laughs> Vernon Jones, who's come out and said that there is widespread fraud, fraud and, um, and deception going on in Georgia, basically. OK, well, um, where is it? Let's see it. Let's hear those claims. I, I, I would be, I, Paul, I would agree yeah. with you. Listen, I would agree with you that the thing you can't have, an election is not decided by the media. I would agree with you. So it's not the case that the votes now stop, are stopped from being counted because the media has decided that Biden's won. Those votes continue to be counted and the Electoral College actually decides at a midway, midway through December. So there's still lots of counting going on. But the direction of travel is clear and as yet the president has not brought forward any evidence. He's just got a few court cases that are going to get uh, chucked out that aren't going to make it to the Supreme Court at this I think, rate. 
I think there are 15, 15 states that it's being questioned in, 15 states that are being questioned to have uh, higher voter turnout than, than, uh, than should be, uh, and highly irregular results, basically, that have happened. Well, let's see it. But, Paul, at the moment, there's nothing. Thank you for your call. Katie Talento is an epidemiologist, former lead health advisor to President Donald Trump on the Domestic Policy Council. Thank you for being there for us this morning, Katie. Um, on coronavirus, then, um, Joe Biden has talked about the monumental task of changing the tone on this to accept the science around coronavirus. Do you think, ultimately, that the president completely mishandled it? Good morning. Hi, good morning. Um, no, I don't think the president mishandled coronavirus. I mean... Uh, he actually did a number of really important things. First, he started the Operation Warp Speed, which is going to get us a vaccine in record time. Second, I think he, you know, he was having in the height of the epidemic at the beginning when we were the most scared and we didn't know what was going on. He had press conferences every single day for two hours to keep the press, mm-hmm. keep the public informed. That was important. But you know, it was. I, I would agree with you. We, we, could have, we could have benefited. We could have benefited from more press conferences here to keep us informed. But it's not just uh, what, uh, the the length of time that he spoke for, but what he said. I mean, all that stuff about bleach. <laughs> it's just embarrassing. From the White House, from the President of the United States, bleach. Come on. So you're talking about a sarcastic comment made once oh, out of. On hours and hours and hours and hours of press conferences. But the other thing to remember about coronavirus Doesn't matter. is the, president. the other thing to remember about coronavirus and about the United States is that we're not a, you know, European monarchy. We actually have a, um, a federal system. So who determines coronavirus response are states and locals. The president gave guidance and his coronavirus task force gave tons mm-hmm. of recommendations. They worked very hard on all the national responsibilities, but the lockdowns that have crushed everyone's economy and the, um, the mandates that are that the American people are, have absolutely had enough of, those are happening at the state level. Which, which would um, potentially affect people's vote if they saw that states had opened up, that the masks were being worn, that people were going out their business. Um, that is to the credit of the individual states the rather than the president, isn't it? What affected the vote in terms of coronavirus are um, how angry people are at the crushing of their economic futures by their governors. So that people voted for Biden to be president because of the lockdowns? No, I don't think the people did vote for Biden to be president. I mean, there that that is very much still being litigated. Very much. Yeah, we, we, there is there are thousands and thousands of votes under fraud. There are more votes that are registered voters in a number of states. Okay, well, where, again, they, where is the court case that the president's legal team have brought to suggest this? Um, there's at least eight of them already. What do you mean? The president has not st- stood up and said, this is the court case I am bringing. These are the specifics I am arguing about the voter fraud that I see happening. His legal in team literally had a press conference yesterday with the witnesses one after the other. What do you mean? I mean that there is no evidence yet that there has been any suggestion that there are, that, you know, this is so, so after the fact, Katie. eyewitnesses that sign an affidavit incredulous. are what we call evidence. Eyewitnesses that sign an affidavit are what we call evidence. You don't have to prove a case before it gets to court. You have to have enough evidence to bring an investigation. That's what a court right. case does. It says, hey, well, listen, there's enough of it. it. Yeah. Katie, I, I, I'm all up for having these claims heard. If these claims are being made, I think anybody who's interested in democracy being done fairly should should have those claims heard. But the idea that they are so widespread that it is going to completely upend this the, the vote of the result of this election, I think is is fanciful. Thank you very much for your time, Katie Talento, epidemiologist, former lead health advisor to President Donald Trump. After the news at twelve, we'll talk about the vaccine czar that has run up a three quarter of a million pound PR bill as the COVID gravy train rumbles on. You're listening to Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Swarbrick on Sunday. It's 12 o'clock. Let's get the news headlines. Holly Harris. On your radio, on Global Player and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at midday. 
The Defence Secretary has told LBC the UK's special relationship with the US is secure, no matter who is in the White House. Ben Wallace has denied Boris Johnson's close alignment with the Trump administration could be an issue for the new president-elect, Joe Biden. Speaking to Swarbrick on Sunday, he insists the bond is much stronger than politics. Day in, day out, the United States and the United Kingdom work together militarily around the world to defend our values, to keep us safe here at home, keep the United States safe at home. And no matter who, whether it's a democratic government in America or Republican, what matters is that we share those values and we share our common security and investments as well. Joe Biden was named as the president-elect last night. He won more than 74 million votes. 70 million votes went to his opponent, Donald Trump. Speaking to LBC, Pippa Malmgren, former special assistant to President George W. Bush, says Joe Biden will have a tough job bringing the country together. Trump won three million more voters than he had the first time around. And so his constituency is big and powerful and cannot be ignored or shunted to the side. And it does have implications for how he'll govern. I think it means that he can't move policy as far to the left. And Donald Trump isn't giving up. He's instructed his legal team to file a number of lawsuits alleging vote rigging, but has as yet failed to provide any evidence. The former editor of the Financial Times, Lionel Barber, has met Mr Trump at the White House. He's told LBC he isn't too surprised that he's not backing down. I've interviewed five American presidents. I've never seen anything like Donald Trump in the Oval Office. It was like a king in a medieval court which, by the way, may explain why he's having so much reluctance in accepting the election result and leaving. A scaled-back Remembrance Sunday has been observed across the UK. The public haven't been able to attend public ceremonies due to coronavirus restrictions. So the Royal British Legion asked that the two-minute silence was observed at home on the doorstep instead. Captain Sir Tom Moore, the 100-year-old World War II veteran, has told Swarbrick on Sunday he never felt bitter about having to fight. I was fighting for not only my country, but everyone that I knew who were all great, great people, all my family and all my best friends, and never ever was there any ill feeling or hatred to anyone who either was fighting for or fighting with. The weather, cloudy across the UK with some rain in the west, which will be heavy in places. A high today of 14 Celsius. From Global's newsroom, I'm Holly Harris. is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Very good afternoon to you. Five past twelve is the time you're listening to Swarbrick on Sunday here on LBC. I'm Tom Swarbrick. Hope we find you very well this Sunday afternoon as we stride into Sunday afternoon. Uh, We'll get more reaction to President-elect Joe Biden, his speech last night having been declared as being... Uh, the presumptive winner of the U.S. election by the U.S. networks. Of course, the counting still continues, and as you've been hearing, there is a legal battle going on. Uh, Donald Trump and his team trying to fight what they say is electoral fraud in the United States. They are bringing what they suggest is evidence of that, widespread evidence of that, to the courts. I will, of course, continue to reflect on that seismic U.S. election result. I want to talk to you, though, this hour about coronavirus, which... <laughs> Yes, is still here. Uh, And partly uh, because the Welsh lockdown that you've all been living under in Wales for the last few weeks ends tomorrow. We'll speak to the First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, a little bit later on this hour. Um, And because there are so many stories around about coronavirus at the moment, I want to talk about the Nightingale hospitals as well a bit later. But I want to start with this on the front page of this morning's Sunday Times. And another astonishing story about the the apparent coronavirus gravy train that is still rumbling away in this country. Uh, They have a story suggesting that the head of the government's vaccine task force has charged the taxpayer £670,000 
for a team of boutique public relations consultants. This is a woman called Kate Bingham. She's a venture capitalist. She happens to be married to Jesse Norman, who is a Conservative minister. She was appointed to the role by Boris Johnson. And since June, she has used eight full-time consultants from Admiral Associates, which is a London PR agency, to oversee her media strategy. And according to leaked documents to the Sunday Times, she has already spent half a million pounds on the team, which is contracted until the end of the year. It means that each consultant is on the equivalent of £167,000 a year. That is, of course, more than the Prime Minister's salary. Uh, And we're told that um, Kate Bingham insisted on hiring them despite concerns that they would duplicate the work of about 100 communication staff at the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy in which her task force sits. So you have this slightly perverse system, it would seem, where despite being in a government role, rather than taking advantage of the government press officers who are already on the payroll, no, £670,000 worth of taxpayers' money is now being spent on a boutique public relations consultancy to manage the PR of, of Kate Bingham. Last, This is a, a woman for whom, by the way, it was revealed last week that she had disclosed official sensitive information about the vaccines program to a $200 ahead event for US venture capitalists. Uh, She has addressed a, or will address, a virtual conference of executives, bankers and venture capitalists held by a California biotech company next year with tickets priced at nearly two grand a pop. Whether it is the allegations around the head of the government's vaccine task force and the money that is being spent on PR teams on her behalf, Uh, whether it's the allegations about revealing official sensitive information at very expensive corporate events to learn more about the UK's vaccine programme. This sense of cronyism around coronavirus is really starting to take hold. People talk a lot about Dido Harding, who is managing the Test and Trace programme, a programme that is becoming less and less effective as the weeks and months rumble on. She was handed that job um, by Matt Hancock, the health secretary. She's a Conservative peer. her, Her specialism seems to be in the managing of talk talk as opposed to anything based in medicine. And people are suggesting that it is time for Dido Harding to be moved out of position and someone who knows what they're doing to be placed in. I wonder if time is running out already for Kate Bingham as the head of the government's vaccine task force because it is completely inappropriate and obscene for nearly a million pounds worth of taxpayers' money to be spent on her own PR team when there are government PR people and and press advisors, they're on tap, ready to work with them. 0345 6060973. Is this another example of the COVID gravy train rumbling on? Let's speak to Mark Berkowski, who is a PR expert and founder of the PR agency Berkowski. Thank you very much for coming on the programme this this afternoon, Mark. What's your view of, of what on earth has gone on here? Well, it's, well it's, it's an interesting point of view. I think if you are running a PR agency, you would look at this story and possibly raise your eyebrows at the thought that this didn't go to procurement. Um, clearly, you might argue that the government um, communication teams are under pressure and there needs to be an initiative. Not often do we get an opportunity to talk about fees. Um, But I think when the public take a good look at perhaps some of the fees being paid to consultants or advisors, that's when we seem to get a bit of hot under the collar. I think that the the majority of the PR world would probably um, look at this and say, you know, good fee. Um, Yeah, quite. 167,000 a head. (laughs) Yeah, well, I mean, some, some, you know, it, as I said, you know, PR companies do not like to talk about fees. They probably only boast about fees to their uh, to their network. But this is another example of cronyism. That is a very good, and I don't think this will be the last story. I think there's a great speed gathering behind this, where a lot of um, newspapers and journalists will be looking into this because. Mm. If we're in a war, then you would requisite you requisite the best people to fight that war, and I think we have we're not winning a war against this virus, and therefore the various people who've been employed and their communication teams. Let's not forget the government's own communication um, practice has been pulled into a huge amount of criticism for for sound bites and and whizzy visuals. And if you were to read Private Eye most weeks, there's some you know story about a government advisor in advertising or marketing being called out. Um, mm. But you know there, there should be a procurement process. One would expect this to be a procurement process, and. 
if there is undue influence that people have got, you know, friends or connections with this company, then that usually counts these people out of that process. But for Admiral Associates, I think that they will have acquired, you know, a good fee. And we have seen in war, you know, in history that there are various people who exploit wars and, you know, for financial gain. And uh, this is this is a very disturbing story. But I mean, the facts and what they are doing and what they have been given as a task to do and what they've been able to communicate. We're looking at the nuance that Sunday Times has put on this story. Um, is there a lot more they've been doing? So mm. I would sometimes look at these stories on the face value of it and think how deep do these stories go and what actually are Admiral Associates doing? Are they working you know, for this department, for, for this person, or are they doing a lot more for that than they're, uh, you know, for, for, for the rather good fee that they're, okay. um, they're, they're, they're charging? All right, Mark, appreciate it as always. Thank you, Mark Bukowski, PR expert, founder of PR agency Bukowski. Let's turn to Sir Alistair Graham, former chair of the Committee for Standards in Public Life. Thank you for joining us, Sir Alistair. Um, give us your view on, on this particular tale of the COVID gravy train. Well, I think it's very disturbing that such large sums of public money are really being wasted on uh, uh, unnecessary PR work when, as you've described, there are very many professional PR people employed by the government and certainly in the department that she reports to who uh, could provide any services required. The, um, what, what would normally be the process by which someone uh, goes about appointing outside consultants into government? Well, they would normally get permission from the department concerned to use what budget money they've got for this particular purpose and to then go through a procurement process of some sort. But I think there is a wider issue about the appointment of people like Kate Bingham and Baroness Dido Harding that you referred to earlier because they've never been through any open competitive process mm. for appointment to these particular key uh, positions. And we have a, a body called the Civil Service Commission that's responsible for recruiting civil servants who could have been used to go through a speedy open competitive process to make sure we were getting the best, the best people and people who didn't have very close links to government ministers uh, and to the Prime Minister and their family. Do you think there is a case now developing that it is um, partly, possibly through the need for speed on some of these, because we're moving, you know, this is a, a fight that we need to win pretty quickly, but there is just a bit of a jobs for the boys attitude here, or indeed for the girls too? Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there is. Um, I'm sure it's people wanting, ministers wanting what they would describe as their own people or their own supporters mm. in these key positions, rather than people who may be independent and who may not necessarily call to the government's tune. Great to speak with you. Thank you very much indeed for your time this afternoon. Sir Alistair Graham, former chair of the Committee for Standards in Public Life. Uh, we're told by the paper that the decision to bring in this uh, PR company was signed off by civil servants, not by the business secretary, Alok Sharma. Um, and that last night, the, the business uh, energy and industrial strategy department that he uh, runs declined to give detail of the consultant's work. They are understood, we're told, to help Kate Bingham, the chair of the government's vaccine task force, prepare for media appearances, draft statements. And this is a good one. This is great work. You know, if people out there who are struggling and worried about their jobs, worried about where they're going to bring, them, bring the, the food in uh, to put on the table... These, there, are, there are PR people being paid, and I'm quoting here, to oversee a vaccines podcast on Spotify. 167k a year. Bring it on. I mean, that is fantastic money. If you can get it by overseeing a vaccines podcast on Spotify, there are people who work in podcasts who, who would be laughing you out of town if you suggested that you could earn £167,000 a year by overseeing a vaccines podcast on Spotify. By the way, does anyone listen to it? Has it got good numbers? Anyone loving the podcast? 0345 6060 973. It is another example, isn't it, of 
in the money that is going out the door, rightly to to spend on on trying to protect us all from this coronavirus uh, uh, nightmare that we're living through. Huge, multiple hundreds of billions of pounds spent. There is still a requirement to spend it, not just effectively, but also fairly. And the more examples that the British public see of money being wasted on people who don't seem to be doing a great deal in shadowy circumstances that aren't tr- open and transparent, the more people are going to rage about the crony- cronyism that I think, unfortunately, we are seeing right now. So if you believe it is cronyism, why do you think it's happening? 0345 6060 973. Come to your thoughts in a few moments. Tom Swarbrick here, 1217. LBC. This is LBC Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick, live from Westminster. I don't know how much desire there is in government at the moment to um, man the barricades to defend the head of their vaccine task force, Kate Bingham, who is once again on the front pages of the weekend newspapers, having last week it been discovered that she presented official sensitive material at a virtual conference that executives were talking at um, about the UK's vaccine task force. She presented that information there. And now this week, uh, it seems that she has asked for a very expensive team of of public relations consultants to manage her media and also the <laughs> the overseeing the vaccines podcast on Spotify. I, could, I don't know if I could recommend it to you. I've obviously never heard it. 
Um, the, the, this was a decision that was signed off, we're told, by civil servants, but not the, the Secretary of State, Alok Sharma, in the business department, a department which already has press officers on hand to deal with the media requirements of people who would come under their auspices. You see how much money the government is spending on, on private consultants. Uh, the bill for private consultants hired by the government to help combat the pandemic has climbed to 175 million quid. In the grand scheme of government spending, that's not a huge amount. But uh, as H as Harry texts on 84850, why are we continually continually hiring consultants to provide expertise when that should already be available from within the civil service? If it's not, why is it not? Says Harry, which uh, in part I agree with. And actually there was a story on the front, was it on the front page of the Financial Times yesterday about Dominic Cummings and the government looking to bring in many more skills from outside so that they don't have to uh, offer it out to external consultants who operate in different ways, are clearly very expensive, uh, and who ha perhaps have a much more transactional relationship uh, with the government here and they just view them as a bit of a cash cow. 0345 I'll come to David in just a moment, but I want to bring you a piece of breaking news. The Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, uh, has been speaking in the last few moments about the US election. Take a listen. I congratulate uh, President uh, Biden, President-elect Biden, very much on his on his victory, and of course I, I congratulate uh, Kamala Harris on being the first uh, female vice president, as, as she will become in the history of the of the United States. And uh, the United States is our closest and most important ally, and uh, that's been the case under president after president, prime minister after prime minister, it won't, it won't change. And I look forward very much to working with President Biden and his team on a lot of uh, crucial stuff for us in the, in the weeks and months ahead. Uh, tackling climate change, uh, trade, international security, many, 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 many other issues. Interesting that the prime minister there the first issue that he wants to tackle with Joe Biden is the issue of climate change. I mentioned it on our election coverage the other night on, gosh, when was it? Tuesday. That Joe Biden has a real problem with climate change because of the, the demand of the left of the party to see it as the big issue, to get massive, massive progress on it, which politically is very difficult for him. And secondly, it's very difficult because the US now is energy independent. Do they want to really give up the fracking that produces the shale gas that means that they can be energy independent? Britain has an opportunity there with the chairing of the COP uh, 26 climate summit to offer Joe Biden some wins on the issue of of the climate campaign that he's undertaking, the Green New Deal, so called. Interesting that Boris Johnson goes in on that. Clearly, something that the UK government believes they have um, some agreement with Joe Biden on at a time when the need for a relationship with Joe Biden is paramount. Given as we learned the other day, Boris Johnson's actually never met him. Uh, let's come to your calls. Here's David in Enfield this morning on the subject of the cronyism. Hi, David. Good morning, Tom. Tom, Hello, as a taxpayer. As a, as a taxpayer, I'm highly concerned about all the billions of pounds that have been spent in the private sector on contracts to supply PPE and now all the money that's being spent on uh, COVID testing kits. And um, a lot of these contracts have been issued without any normal competitive tendering procedures. And it's worse than that because you've actually got serving MPs who are being retained as advisors to companies in the healthcare sectors that are getting major contracts to supply testing kits again without any competitive tenders. I mean, this guy Owen Patterson, uh, who, who's the MP for Shropshire, I think it's Shropshire North, he's being paid £100,000 a year as a consultant to a company called Randox Health, who okay. have got several large um, contracts for COVID uh, testing uh, supplies without any competitive tender. Now, he is... She is his late wife. Uh, she was um, chairman of the ANC race course. And she's yes. got extensive connections in the jockey club, which, which Dido Harding also has extensive connections in the jockey club. So it seems to me, you know, there's this sort of clique of um, people in the sort of orbit, uh, high orbit of the Tory party who are benefiting from all these contracts without them being put out the tender. It's interesting, David, that, that I think what's required is the transparency, as you say, the open, transparent... Uh, tender Absolutely. process that might happen. But then but then we could argue then about speed, whether it can be done as quickly as it's required. We need the testing kits very, very rapidly. Um, and secondly, when, when it comes to issues of MPs doing other jobs, um, acting as, as advisors for whatever firm, I, I have to say I don't I don't particularly mind that if it's 
if it's being declared and if it's transparent. Um, but Tom, and this is, Tom, it, it, have on. you ever had a job in your life where your employer, like these MPs are paid 86,000, whatever it is now, 86,000, yeah, they proposed year now, they get 120,000 expenses. Uh, you know, they're supposed to be representing their constituents, which I would think would be a full-time job under normal circumstances, especially in, in, in the situation we're in now. Can I have offer you, you David... Have you ever heard of an employer allowing some, you're paying full time, which we're doing as taxpayers, to have other jobs? It's just unheard of in the private sector. It would never happen. Well, listen, listen, I, I'm going to, David, I'm going to offer you um, a really unpopular opinion because I actually think MPs should be paid more. I think if we're looking to get, to attract um, people of, of good standing who have had great careers in business or in, or in science or doing something extraordinary, if we're going to attract people into politics, which is rough and tumble and then some right now, I think actually paying people more is not a bad idea. I'm not for a minute suggesting 80 grand isn't a lot of money. By uh, standards in this country, it is a lot of money. But to attract the kind of people that I think a lot of people want to have in politics, I'm not sure it's that much. Your thoughts? Hello? Is it stunned silence? Yes, you're on, David. No, no, yeah. no. no I, wanted to get, I wanted to get back to you. You see, the problem is, if you allow all these MPs to have other jobs... I mean, Boris Johnson, from the time he left uh, being Foreign Secretary to the time he won the Conservative Party uh, leadership, he earned over £700,000 in addition to his to money we're paying him to be an MP in, in, from, from uh, publication royalties, from public speaking. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Theresa May has earned over £400,000 from the international talking circuit since she, she left her post as Prime Minister. And, you know, mm -hmm. you have to say to yourself, why are they being paid all this money? What's in it for them? Well, the big be, company is well, not going to pay these people all this money if, if they're not getting something in return. And my worry is, you know, is, is it's a corruption, of I think, of our parliamentary process. I, I, I think in, in government, there are very strict rules about who it is ministers can work with and what it is they can do. Out of ministers government, can't, if you come out ministers of government... Can't, no, the point is ministers can't work with anybody. It's the MPs that are doing it. No, I agree. I agree. So, that, the, so that's what I'm saying. So in government, there is a, there are very, very clear... David, thank you, by the way. You provide good background there. In government, it is absolutely right that there are very strict rules. And actually, for people who have left government, and I'm talking about even very junior, very rubbish uh, advi advisors in number 10 now, um, I, I had to go through a process to, to make sure that I wasn't going to lobby the government for a period of time after I left government or that the, this link, that link and the other were all tested and looked at. It's called a process called the ACOBA process. Um, um, which, to be honest with you, doesn't have um, a great set of gnashes because there are plenty of people, and I'm afraid the, the current Prime Minister is one of these people, who left government as Foreign Secretary and then went straight into a job um, which, without the say-so of, of a COBA, the process by which it meant to tick the fact that he could do a job, uh, whatever it is outside of government, having come out only very recently, he didn't bother with that process. He went straight back into writing for The Telegraph. Now, what a, what is this government body, this ACOBA process, meant to do about that? I'm not really sure. So, in government, I agree. For MPs... Yes, eighty grand is a lot of money in the grand in in when it, you put it up against the average salary in this country. But again, if we want to attract the right people into politics, good people who have had astonishingly successful careers, who could bring something else to it other than those that have just risen up through the ranks, you know, all the times that people have been it was David Cameron, wasn't it? Went into politics at a very young age, special advisor here, special advisor there, worked in the Conservative Party headquarters, became an MP, became a minister, became prime minister. If we don't want that career politicians, if we want to bring people in from other careers to do this, who are of particular standing, I do think you have to pay them more. I think it's a it's not an illegitimate way of earning more money to, to work as an advisor for different parts of, of the economy. But as long as it's open and transparent and can be seen as such. And at the moment, we have too much secrecy around some of these, not only some of these appointments, uh, but some of these um, con contracts that are being sent out to private companies as well. 0345 6060 973. Want to come to more of your calls on this in just a few moments. Tom Swarbrick here, 12.30. News headlines now. Here's Tim Humphrey.
The Defence Secretary has told LBC the British government is looking forward to getting down to business with Joe Biden. The Democrat has passed the 270 Electoral College votes needed to win the 2020 US presidential election. Donald Trump has yet to concede defeat. He's told his lawyers to file a number of lawsuits over alleged vote rigging, but so far hasn't offered any evidence. The traditional service of remembrance has taken place at the Cenotaph in London. Coronavirus restrictions meant the public weren't allowed to watch in person, but members of the royal family and government were there, along with a limited number of veterans. And the weather cloudy across most of the UK, with fog in northeast England, rain in the west, brighter in Scotland, a high of 15. This is LBC. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Text 84850. Very good afternoon to you, Paul in Bristol. You're going to be next on the radio about the uh, the vaccine SAR, who's run up a three-quarter of a million pound nearly PR bill uh, used with taxpayers' money. We'll come on to that in just a moment. But I want to continue our coverage of the US election, the result still not fully in, but at least declared now that Joe Biden is going to be the next president of the United States. He gave that speech a little bit earlier. Meanwhile, on the Trump side of the campaign, take a listen to his personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. Oh my goodness, all the networks. Wow, all the networks. We have to forget about the law. Judges don't count. All the networks, all the networks. 
All the networks thought Biden was going to win by 10 percent. Gee, what happened? Come on. No, don't be don't be ridiculous. Networks don't get to decide elections. Courts do. <laughs> I mean, you got to laugh. Uh, you, you laugh because the delivery is is relatively funny. The point he's making, the underlying point, I actually find myself agreeing with that. No, the media does not decide who wins elections, that the voters decide who wins elections and the votes are still being counted. So Rudy Giuliani and the team have started to bring more legal action. Let's speak to Philip Lacovara, former Deputy Solicitor General of the United States. He was counsel to the Watergate special prosecutor during the impeachment hearings of President Nixon. Thank you very much for being on the programme this morning. Uh, Mr. Lacavara, um, just uh, on on what you've heard so far coming from the Trump campaign about the allegations that they are making, what do you make of the legal case that they are so far bringing? Good morning to you. Uh, it's somewhere between thin and non-existent. I don't think any serious lawyer uh, considers that President Trump's legal team has any real chance of uh, overturning the evident results of the election. Uh, the, the challenges are essentially frivolous and as Rudy Giuliani's tone and his voice uh, might convey to you. Trump has said that he's going to ca carry on making these these claims um, and doesn't seem likely to concede the election result until those claims have been heard. How long could that process take, do you think? Well, even in the Bush-Gore contested election in 2000, it took about five weeks and that was a much more complicated case uh, and with a much more substantial legal challenge. Uh, I would think that uh, uh, for all practical purposes, uh, the, the judicial string will run out in uh, just a couple of weeks. But I, I don't think anybody here in the States thinks that there's any real doubt about the, uh, the ultimate result here. Mm. Uh, and therefore, even if the formal proceedings may drag on for a couple of weeks, uh, the outcome, unlike Bush Gore in 2000, is not really in question. I've seen that Rudy Giuliani, it's reported Giuliani is, is bringing a second lawsuit in Pennsylvania. And then he says, quote, we're going to bring a federal lawsuit and we're going to take a very good look at whether we bring this nationally. Quite possibly we do a national lawsuit and really expose the corruption of the Democrat Party. Of everything you've heard from the president's legal team, from the president himself, there have been, well, one, there was a law case in Pennsylvania that ruled in Trump campaign's favour, but that was to do with the distance that the observers were in, in looking at the, the balance, the distance away from the balance that those observers were. Have you seen anything that's going to rise up possibly through the court system to the level of the Supreme Court? Well, there, there's just one issue, and it also relates to Pennsylvania, but it, it, it involves only about 2,000 votes, and this concerns... Uh, votes that were uh, cast by election day, but not physically received by the uh, the local pool polling authorities until after election day. And there's a good indication that the current Supreme Court would view those votes as invalid. They've been segregated and shrink wrapped uh, as a result of an earlier U.S. Mm. Supreme Court ruling. But the Pennsylvania authorities have said uh, that's a total of a couple of thousand votes, and therefore there's there's no chance that that will affect the uh, the ultimate result of the Pennsylvania electoral votes. Are you relatively having having seen what you've seen over the past uh, decades or so, and been involved in some very very serious uh, allegations and legal cases against presidents? Are you relatively relaxed about? the fact that this is going to court, that they are trying to bring legal cases, because ultimately Rudy Giuliani is right. It's not the media that decides election results. I'm quite relaxed, and I think most observers are as well. Uh, I've said early on that uh, the country would be saved from the worst excesses of President Trump by uh, the civil service, uh, the press, and the courts. And I think this time, now that the ball is back in the hands of the courts, we can be confident that the outcome will be consistent with the, the voting will of the American public. Mm. Mr. Lacavara, thank you very much indeed for your time. Philip Lacavara, former Deputy Solicitor General of the United States, counsel to the Watergate Special Prosecutor during the impeachment hearings of President Nixon. What an incredible thing to have been involved with. 20 to 1, Caroline, new caller in Great Dunmo in Essex. Hi, Caroline. Hello, uh, Mr. Swarbrick. Um, I'm phoning regarding your comment about increasing MP salaries to stop the moonlighting. Mm. I did um, say I did say it was an unpopular opinion. 
Uh, yeah, no, I know. <laughs> and I can understand why. <laughs> to be honest, I couldn't believe what I was hearing until I looked up and realised that you were actually the sort of ex-advisor, etc., to Tory bigwigs. But um, I, I just, I, I cannot understand that thinking when actually... What is wrong with an £80,000 salary? I just find that quite offensive Nothing. when actually the MP's expenses are, are greater than the average salary in this country. I think it's I actually agree. pretty appalling that, that they, you know, well, that you can even consider putting their salary up. Here's the, here's the thing. So £80,000, as I said, is a lot of money. And, and when you compare it to uh, the average salary in this country, it is a lot more. The it's expenses nearly three times, are, yeah. Absolutely. The expenses are, are out of control. So here's the thing. Why not pay a sliver more of the expenses, scan, uh, expenses money into salary? So you pay MPs 100 grand. You don't bother with the expenses because people can live on 100 grand perfectly happily. They feel very wealthy living on 100 grand perfectly happily. So you actually save money. We prevent MPs from doing more of this moonlighting that causes friction about transparency, upsets a lot of people about what else, uh, which which pressure is being applied onto which MP because they earn money elsewhere. So we say, no, you can't do that. So actually, not only are you now getting value for money here, you're actually preventing any of the issues around transparency. Um, I'm sorry, I think that's almost akin to taking one of those huge corporations like Google or Amazon and others that keep playing being lambasted on, on moral grounds, if nothing else, for looking for loopholes and exploiting them to stop them paying tax in this country and saying, OK, in order to stop you looking for the loopholes, we money, will change Caroline. the I'm tax trying to save, laws to, ena I'm trying we'll to, change the tax laws to enable it. It's akin I'm to, to that. Save I mean, I'm money. surprised you're not embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not embarrassed. I'm, I'm ultimately <laughs> shameless on this one, Caroline, because I, the, the, I agree with you that the expenses system is is crazy. Um, that, that okay, it's very, so very, very expensive. Expenses. Let's go to the salary so to not, get the expenses. Let's not have that. Well, the salary is in part a reflection of the very generous expect expenses. If you can place everything on expenses, you don't need to earn that much salary. So let's get rid of that. Let's have more money in salary for MPs. Let's get, make it. Let's, let's call it a hundred grand for ease of argument. Now we're what? doing away with one hundred and twenty grand a year expenses. So you're already saving on that. It's cost you twenty grand where previously it cost you one hundred and twenty. Good deal. OK, or so now you're, sorry, just to get this straight. So now you're saying actually reduce it, really, from the 80,000 plus 30,000 expenses, call it 100 grand salary, and that they don't get the 30,000 expenses, yeah? Correct. OK, we're going in the right direction. That's fine. As long as there's, you know, it doesn't then suddenly sort of all turn around, you know, I, I, I still think it's too much for a salary and I think they should be serving for their country and for conscience and better for the social good. That's fine. And not just That's fine. And if we want pocket, to say, but... if we want to say to MPs uh, or prospective MPs, if you want to tell people who want to get into public life, listen, you get your, your, you can only earn this much money. It's not going to make you incredibly wealthy beyond your wildest dreams kind of wealthy. Um, that's fine. But I, I worry then that you miss out on a great chunk of the population who might do quite well for themselves, who we might want to see in public life, given how much MPs are sometimes absolutely correctly beaten up um, uh, for, for not being good enough at their jobs. Do we not attract people from a whole different spectrum of industries if, if you offer a bit more in salary? Um, could I not argue that actually there's a lot of incredibly able people who demand salaries much less than 100,000 who are d the backbone of this country doing an incredibly good job running corporations and actually at this very difficult time, you know, um, undertaking tasks and jobs and facing challenges and they don't demand nearly as much as those um, MPs are being paid. It's just that they're not the ones with a high profile. And I do include head teachers there. I include Absolutely. military people. I include people that run charities. Um, I mean, I personally know somebody I think that could do an M five MPs job in one, one go. Um, and you know, he's just an industry, sorry, just an industry. He's an industry and doesn't um, command a salary or anything like that. Why do you have to be motivated by money? I think actually it's really important. I think it's good to have good, able people. I don't think money is the ultimate motivator, I don't think, I don't think, of course they do. I don't think money is the, if you were to, if you were to go in politics to make money, you're going to be solely, di it's, it's incredibly disappointed, it strikes me. Why? The vast How majority do you say of people that when you're looking at £100,000 salary? 
How many well, that's people, the point. How many people that's listening the point, to this program would dream money. of making that much? It's, of course, of course, but it's not the money that is going to motivate people to go in in the first place. I'm agreeing with you that the first motivation for people to go into, the politi- into politics is normally a social conscience. It's normally yes. wanting to make lives better for people. Mm-hmm. And and the good salary is a very good bonus. Okay, I'm, I, I, Caroline, I'm trying as as I've explained. I'm trying to make it cheaper. I'm trying to reduce the expenses down. I told you it was unpopular. Thank you for your call. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. If you want to continue to throw pelters, that's my number. Twelve forty five. <laughs> Coming up at one on LBC, Majid Noirs. He has waited 48 years for this moment, and last night, President-elect Joe Biden gave what's been reported as the best speech in his career. After four years of deep division, how does Biden unite the country? Majid Noirs on LBC. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick, live from Westminster on LBC. 10 to 1, here's Marie in Raysbury. Hiya, Marie. Oh, hello, Tom. Uh, nice to speak hello. to you. 
I am a little bit irate at the moment, so excuse my tone of voice, but I have to say this. I've wondered from the fact that they brought in people from the outside, from private enterprise, into to do jobs that they haven't been qualified in to do. We've got an army, we've got civil servants, and we've got a whole load of people that could have done this for free. Instead, they are feathering their own nests, they have chosen friends, nobody's looking at them, they sign off big, huge checks that's coming from the public purse, who are struggling at this moment in time. They are, you know, the cheek of it when they don't even help poor little children who might not have enough food. And here we are today, in November, all these months after, questioning why this is happening. It should have been questioned from day one, because in my business, if I hadn't have done my job properly, I would have been out that door within a week. And I want this really now, Tom, to get stronger and stronger. I do agree with you in certain areas where you say people that are going to do a good job, let's put them in there first, t- tried and tested first, see if they're doing a good job, and if they are, let's raise their salary. Mm. No more of this skullduggery that's going on. This corporate world today is full of greed. It's all about money, feathering their own nests, creating circles within themselves that nobody can break down, get into, or scrutinise. And we need to. Do you know what, Marie? The other thing as well is I, I'm not. I, the other thing as well is I'm not sure actually how effective it is. I'm not sure that it that it works particularly well. Uh, some of these consultancies that come in to do various things that the government is doing. Certainly, some of those um, firms that are brought in to look after. I don't know whether it's Serco or G4S beset uh, with problems. So they don't seem to be working that often either. Hey, Marie, thank you very much for... Listen, I'm going to have to move on, Marie. I do apologise because I've got Mark Drakeford waiting on the line for me, the uh, First Minister of Wales. Thank you very much indeed for coming on the programme uh, this afternoon, First Minister. Um, so you are to bring Wales out of its lockdown tomorrow. Tell us what the R number is doing right now. Well, the R number just now, we will not know for another two weeks because the R number is always... Uh, a week or two behind where the virus is. The R number as we went into Wales's fire break was between 1.2, 1.3, that sort of uh, area. And we hope, of course, as we come out to the lockdown, when we get the figure, which will not be for a week or so, then it'll be down below one in Wales. And if it isn't? Well, we believe that it will be because that's the advice we had. The indications in Wales are that people in Wales have been sticking to the fire break. Travel is back to where it was at the beginning of May. Uh, Mm -hmm. We will continue to assess all those measures. We think we've got a path through to Christmas. It will depend crucially on how people behave after Monday. Uh, And uh, I've been trying to get the message across to people in Wales after Monday, don't ask yourself, what can I do? Don't try to find a way of stretching the rules and, you know, trying to get the most out of them you can. Ask yourself, what should I do? What should I do to protect myself and to protect others? We can do that. We'll build on the success of the last 17 days. But to go back to my, my question, if the R number isn't below one, and we all hope it is, but if the R number isn't below one, you can't rule out another lockdown. You might have to go again. Well, Tom, uh, I'm not going to just speculate in that way. We think what we have done will see us. It's not spec- on with a path respect. It's not Christmas. speculation. You you can't have. We can't have. The pop- public can't have. Are being above one for for too long because, as you know, the virus then spreads and grows. It seems to me that the principal t- weapon we have against this virus right now is a lockdown. If are still above one, presumably logic means and the scientific advice that you've been getting means you have to do it again. And I know that's not easy. That's not easy for you to say. It's not easy for the people of Wales to hear. But if we're honest, that's where we are, isn't it? Well, it's it's not the advice we've had. See, the advice we've had is that, provided we've done the things we have done, then the R number will come down below one. Uh, and but the advice to take to you into the lockdown Christmas. was, in order to bring the lockdown, in order to bring R below one, you needed to lock down. So, are you anticipating that advice changes in? in justifying another lockdown at whatever point that may be? Well, we will follow the advice at the time. Lots of things will change over the coming weeks. 
Uh, look at what has happened in Denmark just in the last couple of days. Things might get worse. Look at what is happening in relation to testing, where we expect to have a different generation of tests that people can administer mm -hmm. themselves and give themselves an answer within half an hour. We expect those things to come available in the next few weeks. Coronavirus has taught me this, at least, Tom, that you, you just can't look down the future as though it were a crystal ball. Uh, in two weeks, four weeks, but uh, the isn't other side that with of respect? Isn't that also the that is in a sense what we are doing with the demands for a lockdown? We are saying that that it should be the case that in a couple of weeks, seventeen days after the lockdown, the R is below one. That is what is that if not staring into the crystal ball? It makes it makes complete sense the number of people who stay away from each other is going to help in stopping the virus. But to suggest we can't look too far forward is, I would suggest, wrong, and. Just to be, again, once again, very clear, if R is above one, that is the point at which you as the leader of the, of the Welsh, uh, as the Welsh First Minister, you have to make a judgment about whether you go back into lockdown. So this is a public health emergency. And if that emergency in Wales requires us to take further action, uh, then we certainly will uh, do that and we won't shy away from it. Does that automatically mean another lockdown? No, it doesn't. There are other things that we may be able to do. There may be other possibilities that we don't have at the moment that we will have, not in months' time, but in weeks' uh, time. Uh, we will always monitor the position in Wales, and if we have to take further action, we can. But this sort of binary choice between uh, will you stay as you are, will you go into another lockdown, I think that oversimplifies the complexity of the circumstances and the decisions that we face every day. I don't envy you having to make them. Mark Drakeford, thank you very much indeed for your time. First Minister of Wales joining us live on the programme as Wales comes out of lockdown for now, tomorrow. Adrian's in Nantes in France. Hi, Adrian. Hi, how are you? I'm well, sir. Your thoughts? Uh, I think you're right in respect of um, MP salaries. They need to be increased and the whole expenses what? regime needs to be changed. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, it, it's, it's not really a, a complicated situation. If you want to attract the very brightest and best 650 people to scrutinise billions of pounds worth of public spending and to do the job properly, then you want to in attract people uh, for whom um, uh, becoming a, a Member of Parliament doesn't necessarily mean a, a significant cut in their salary. Mm. Uh, that's just dog standard, uh, you know, no brain economics. Um, I mean, I worked in Parliament under the old expenses regime and uh, for a brief time under the new uh, regime. Um, and what you have, unfortunately, is a fairly emotional um, uh, conversation in the populace about MPs' expenses that doesn't actually shed much light on what really happens. The reality is that under the new ex the new uh, IPSA regime, the uh, Independent Parliamentary Standards Authority regime, um, most MPs uh, in some way or form sponsor or, or subsidise their accommodation in London because IPSA keep a very tight rein on how much members of Parliament can spend on accommodation and most now simply right, need so. to stay in hotels. Or Sorry? Yeah. Well, yeah, rightly or, or, so that Ipsa keeps keeps a uh, keeps a good tab of that. Uh, Adrian, interestingly, we found one person who supports my position. Thank you. Chris is in Richmond for thirty seconds. Hi there, Chris. Oh yeah. Well, I thought we'd taken back his control of our money and our lord uh, and our borders. You know, it's pretty tell four years ago we're talking about the spin and propaganda and abuse of taxpayers' money by the EU. Well, what you've been talking about for the last hour is exactly the same. But yeah, it's our government. It is absolute rank hypocrisy from any minister complaining about anyone else wasting taxpayers' money. Well, listen, I think... It's unbelievable. Yeah, listen, I, I, I take the point, Chris. I refer... But callers have come on, Marie in particular, calling uh, on the idea that we actually have a lot of this expertise in-house. I would just say again, particularly on this, on this Remembrance Sunday, we've got to make much more use, better use, of not just the military and their numbers, but the military and their mindset and their processes in government in order to actually make it effective rather than having to apparently rely on uh, outside consultancies. Chris, thank you for your call. Listen, thank you for all your calls during the course of the programme this weekend. It's been an absolutely astonishing week. Thank you for joining us for it on the programme. We're back next Sunday, Swarbrick on Sunday, with you at 10am. If you missed anything, Global Player is available to you at four, Ian Payne, next on LBC, Majid Nawaz. Thank you, Tom. Coming up, Donald Trump is yet to concede the US election race, but if he is on his way out, how do you evaluate his track record? Before that, in a post-Brexit Britain, the biggest prize is a trade deal with the United States. But Joe Biden and the Democrats have previously firmly opposed Brexit and stood up for the Good Friday Agreement. So, what does a Joe Biden victory mean for Britain? 
But first, he has waited 48 years for this moment. And at last, last night, President-elect Joe Biden looks as